9 березня 2022 2014, Russia invaded Ukraine. In 2022, Russia started a full-scale war. I could see my mother, and I realized she was dead. And this, these stories on the front pages of newspapers shocked the world. There are thousands of stories nobody never heard before. We are collecting unique archive of testimonies by civilians that suffered from the war. That's my house. They became witnesses and heroes. We've collected 80 dramatic, 80,000 dramatic and tragic histories. Our mission is to preserve the past for the better future. Give the voice to people who need to be heard. What people got, hatred towards everything Russian. A database is open for film directors, writers, researchers. We're going to win. People can't be defeated. Those who can't be silenced for those who want to learn the truth from the Rinat Ahmedov Foundation, unique testimonies by civilians for everyone who can tell a story to the world to make sure that the world doesn't forget. Search, look, speak. Dear friends, <coughs> you're welcome. This is the official start of the forum. It starts now on a first offline meeting of Ukrainian International Documentation Initiatives Oral History Forum of Ukraine. Recently, on the 29th of uh, March, we've commemorated the memory of Babin Yar victims. One of the biggest atrocities of the 20th century of the Second World War, one of the scariest pages of the world in Ukrainian history. And we've looked at a new page within a different strategy, a drama that's still unveiling a part of the war that we are still going through. Our society is uh, facing one of the greatest challenges in our history, and of course, it influenced everyone now during every meeting. When Ukrainians get together among themselves or they meet people, other people. They talk about 2014, 2022, 24th of February, volunteering, moving, surviving blackouts and air alerts, struggle, heroism, and losses. Unfortunately, that's the truth, the tragedies. It's a huge number of uh, diverse stories and testimonies during the war. The stories of civilians are collected by the museum, uh, Civilian Voices Museum. It's been five years, actually more, they've been documenting civilian testimonies and they've collected so far more than 86,000 testimonies that don't just are related to the full-scale invasion period since 24th of February, but since the beginning of the Russian invasions since 2014. And the Civilian Voices Museum is the one of the biggest archives of testimonies of people who suffered from the Russian-Ukrainian war. These uh, experiences are different, and, and this is why it's important how we collect store these stories, how we tell these stories, because they are part of our 
uh, modern history, and this is how they shape the future, and they will shape our vision of the future. This is why uh, the Civilian Voices Museum has organized uh, Oral History Forum in Ukraine. The main purpose of the forum is to create uh, links and relations in the researchers community, people who document uh, war experience. The job is to tell the truth about the war and create uh, grounds for multidisciplinary dialogue and to consolidate efforts. Uh, by implementing this purpose, the whole community of institutions is working. This forum is organized by the um, Civilian Voices Museum under uh, Rina Takhmeta Forum. It's also assisted by Shoah Foundation and Oral History Foundation. Founded by Steven Spielberg after his short uh, Schindler's List, the forum, is one of the biggest archives of uh, oral testimonies about Holocaust. It has more than 53,000 testimonies. The other organization I've mentioned, uh, the Oral History Association, is based in Texas, USA. Uh, it was founded in 1966. It uh, is an association of uh, directors and researchers from all around the world, and the the museum has become a member of this association. Also, we have educational partners, uh, among which is a Kiev National University of Taras Shevchenko and uh, Marie Curie Sklodowska University in Lublin, Poland. And I guess partner of any event that happens in Ukraine, actually, they made it possible they are our art forces. Big thanks to them. Thanks for making it happen. Thanks for protecting the sky over us. Thanks for making sure that there is no air alert right now and um, creating a possibility to talk about this experience and about the future. A couple of words about the forum. Uh, we have three panel discussions on the agenda during which the participants will discuss different aspects of uh, documenting uh, war experience. The first discussion, when experience becomes knowledge. It will focus on uh, turning document experiences into knowledge about war and then into historical memory, uh, shaping state policies, policies uh, under state institutions as part of the history vision. The second panel is oral history challenges, roles, and problems. It will focus on how different institutions documenting war experience function. And panel number three, documentation of war experience and the future. This panel will discuss the meaning of the array of information and the documentation process for the future, for different areas of our everyday life for the future. In order to open the forum, on behalf of the organizers and uh, the Civilian Voices Museum, I would like to invite Natalia Yemchenko, uh, member of the supervisory vision of the um, uh, Rina Takhmeta Fund. Hello, everyone. I will try to be as short as possible. Well, first, Thanks a lot to everyone who's joining us online and offline, our partners, our speakers, and of course, you dear guests and participants and attendees of the forum. I would like to say that for us, it's a great honor and a great possibility to make our contribution into the documentation of oral history as one of the methods. We all understand very well that documentation, documentation initiatives that uh, happen in Ukraine are a response to these atrocities that happen in our country. Uh, at the same time, they are very meaningful for us to understand who we are, because oral history is one of the greatest tools to to help us understand who we are and fill the gaps. 
and uh, make sure that we can recall and memorize because without that possibility we are living other people's myths we don't know who we are we can't shape our future we remain traumatized and we live within other people's narratives which is which means occupation just like occupation physical occupation of a territory uh, so thank you very much for that and I would like to say that we also have a very powerful Polish delegation here. So I would like to express my uh, appreciation to Valentin Baluk, uh, director of the Eastern European University, Lublin University, of Marie Curie Skadowska, one of the Polish centers where they work with the memory. They are our partner, and um, we are very proud of that relationship because our academic partners are not just a possibility to be on the same page it's an assurance for us that everything that we do in the field it expands and uh, this is how we turn pain into experience experience into knowledge and knowledge into um, narrative and we have super powerful institutions in Europe that uh, make sure that transition happens. And I would like to express my thanks to Piotr Cewinski, uh, director of the Auschwitz Museum. He's our special guest, and it's a great honor for us to host you here. I would like to express my thanks to our Ukrainian partners. I named them all, but. Uh, it's a uh, rector of uh, Shevchenko University, Mr. Bagrov. He's here with us. Anton Drobovic, uh, director of the National Memory Institute, our longtime partner. Maybe I, I, I won't name you all, but I just want to say that uh, it we, we could have made it without you because now we have people to take advice from, people to rely upon. We are in the parking space. We're not going anywhere during the air alert. This is a protected uh, shelter, and uh, hopefully it's not going to happen. But I asked Mr. Baluk who, when he was in Kiev, he said three or four years ago, and I asked, did something change? He said, well, not really if you don't have air alerts. And And uh, when I when I returned to the city, I didn't know what the city would be because the war changes everything, and hopefully this event will leave something behind. And what we hope for, well, this event was. Uh, founded a couple of years ago. We talked to our psychologists and back in 2015. So we've collected thousands of uh, hours of conversation with uh, our partners. It's uh, mostly a gray zone of Luhansk and Donetsk. Oblast. We were just a humanitarian mission there. And it's people living in uh, distress, elderly people, people with disabilities. And we uh, work with wounded children a lot we work with their families but this forum was born this summer and we had a long conversation with Anastasia Platonova she should be somewhere somewhere here here she is and uh, she's a person that's dealing with all sorts of issues she's a must multidisciplinary multidisciplinary for person and the main message was the following everybody's collecting something everybody's doing something and we need to get people together we need to consolidate their efforts we have academicians and researchers we have a great Ukrainian history association we have a great leave cluster uh, film people make something else and uh, human rights activists they 
co record crimes and collect evidence. So that should be a possibility to bring these people together. And we should create something powerful in between. And uh, two months after the conversation, the forum happens. And here we are. This is what we're doing. The next question is, what will be the success? Or what is the purpose of the forum for me personally is to have a conversation about how can we make sure that Ukrainian oral history becomes most efficient, visible on the world community level, and we need to turn our practical experience into subjective phenomenon that will uh, have a global meaning in uh, academic way, human rights way. I would like to have our practice that we are collecting and we're paying a big price for that practice. We just want to make sure it grows out of Ukraine. We want to make sure that everything that we experience um, help the world and um, make the motto never again alive. I would like to make sure that our Ukrainian oral history wins. And the last thing I'd like to say, if everything goes as planned today, we're ready to organize this forum like that every year and we have chosen the topic oral history because the method we're working with is oral history. We know it very much, but it should be a larger platform, uh, larger conversation about initiatives. I don't know how it goes, but uh, it's very important for us to get feedback from you with your ideas. What forum, what kind of format should we have? What kind of ideas should we incorporate? What layers, what disciplines should be engaged in order to make this forum not just a nice place to have a conversation, but also a platform to promote this uh, uh, practice of oral history in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Natalia. We got the impetus, and now we know the purpose and the task of today's discussion to make sure that everything is discussed on the panels, uh, foot for thought, and um, grounds for future networking. You will have breaks, and uh, it's a great opportunity to discuss these topics and during the evening con discussion after 7 p.m., but we need to move on and another welcome world. Academic community is a key player in uh, the history and in the study of history. And it, the forum is a partnership with uh, the key of Shevchenko University. And I'm giving the floor to Volodymyr Pogrov, the rector of the university. Good afternoon, dear friends. I'd like to remind you that it's 10th of October, and this is uh, one year ago, a missile hit one of, one of our central streets in Kiev. A Russian missile hit a place in downtown area, and this is what we remember as well. They asked me before the before the forum began what this forum is about, and I'm thankful to to, to Natalia, and she's uh, crazy enough in a good way to do projects like that, and we had this. Um, uh, we had our the, we had some publications that the, the SEM published. I still have them. There are three different areas: pol policy. Um, legal area and moral morality. 
Well, policy is, is a matter of, uh, is a subject of uh, law enforcement, and we have people here working in the international tribunal. Policy is not our thing, really, but morality is our thing. So this project is about the morality and documentation of atrocities for the International Criminal Court. That's not our thing. Politics, that's for politicians and among, and for us as a society, morality is what's important. No matter how much I get to hear about the Second World War, as for me, uh, this enemy of ours and the neighbor of ours, Voldemort, um, is the heart of everything that happened during the Second World War. And my grandfather, Simon Baziluk, who went through this war from the Volga to Prague, fighting with the Nazis. And the moral truth and righteousness is not on the side of Voldemort country, which is to the north of our country, but it is on the side of our grandfathers and sisters. But this usurpation has resulted in the fact that we declared, uh, and we kept repeating, never again. But there, everyone repeats their main slogan, this can happen again, this can be repeated again. So for me, oral history and storytelling is about recording of traumatic experiences both here in Ukraine and beyond the borders of Ukraine. Our nearest friend is Poland. So the whole core is about reflecting and conveying this moral truth and righteousness like Gegel speaks about, that we have to reflect that we are right and we have to convey this righteousness and truth and then we will definitely win. Therefore, I wish all of us strong health and very comfortable and fruitful work today. I thank you very much indeed for this invitation. It's not my first time in this place, and it's the best uh, start for us not to stop. But of course, I wish all of us just peace and victory. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Volodymyr. One more partner of our forum is the academic partner. It's uh, Lublin University, named after Maria Curie Skladovska. And please welcome Professor Valentin Baluk, Director of Eastern Europe Institute, representative of Maria Curie Skladovska University. Perhaps I can help you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me please read the welcoming remarks by the uh, director of our university uh, address to the first uh, forum participants of the oral history forum. On behalf of the university, uh, Maria Curie Skladovska University, and on my own behalf, I would like to welcome you all to the first forum of oral history of Ukraine. Oral history of you, uh, has a big role to play in the shaping of history and historic consciousness of nations, in particular the Ukrainian nation. In the context of resistance to the Russian aggression, the museum, the voices of the peaceful, is playing a key role in collecting and propagating oral stories narrated by peaceful Ukrainians who were confronted by the hardships of this war. Holding the first forum of uh, this forum plays a significant role in shaping the culture of both Ukraine and Eastern European nation. Our university values very highly our collaboration with Renat Akhmetov Foundation in implementing different initiatives, and this one in particular. So we were very happy to join the organization of this forum. I congratulate Renat Akhmetov Funds on instigating this most important initiative, and I wish you, the participants of this forum, um, every success. Professor Radoslav Rodovsky. Please. On my own behalf, I would also like to thank Ms. Natalia Yemchenko, um, Renata Akhmetov's foundation board member, with whom we have already aligned very fruitful cooperation and relationship. Would you kindly stand next to me? I wouldn't like to stand above you. Therefore, my personal gratitude to you for your personal work that you are engaged in, because I very much appreciate our academic relations connections 
With the partners, these connections are always of high value because you provide us with not only with theoretical but also practical knowledge. And Kiev University Rector has spoken about morality and what you are engaged in is definitely this dimension because you are not only documenting and recording. You will not only be engaged in an archiving all of these testimonials, but also, and you have mentioned that, you've spoken about perspectives. And for me, the establishment and shaping of this museum, the voices of the peaceful, will have to be accompanied by the um, um, establishment of the museum of the narratives to show the hardships of this war. And I suppose that we will continue to work very fruitfully, not only with the, within the framework of our agreement, but within the framework of other um, agreements. And I would like to give to you as a token of our appreciation and trust uh, in that it's a set of our students to show that we will be studying and helping the witnesses, eyewitnesses, who in many cases have personally lived through all of these tragic experiences. But as it was already repeatedly said, our main goal must be never again, never again for these things to happen and to be repeated because we have already had the first, the second, and the question is whether we are on the threshold of the Third World War. And yet again, we are posed with the question, why do we have to repeat to ourselves never again? Because the Punisher has never been condemned. Therefore, we have to keep collecting all of this evidence to demonstrate it to the further generations and for all of them, all of these eyewitness accounts to be demonstrated in before the courts, international ones in particular, to uh, call the perpetrator to their account. Thank you very much indeed and sorry for overtaking the time allocated to me. Thank you from the bottom of our heart and now Ms. Natalia, would you kindly not go away uh, far from the stage because we have planned several keynote speakers and keynote speeches to take place during our forum today. And one of these first keynote speak speakers uh, will be talking about who and for what, how the field of uh, the initiative of modern history in Ukraine is taking place. And it's not only Ms. Natalia, but also Evgenia Blesnyuk. She is a sociologist and the founder of Gradus Research, research company. So the first keynote speech at our today's forum. Can I kindly have the second microphone? Thank you. Nastya has said to us that we had to set, uh, set up and organize a keynote speech, and I got down to it, and then I dialed um, my friend's telephone number, and I said whether or not we would be able to do something heavily depended on the methodology, who will be applying this methodology, who are the practitioners and the people applying these methodologies, whether they're big or small. Some of them are recognized, others are less conspicuous, and it heavily depends also on what people think about the methodology applied. So we ran this particular research, a survey. We are going to demonstrate its results. We are not going to publish it fully, but I mean right now during this forum, but it will be uh, sent to you together with all of the materials of our conference. Before we move on to the key uh, note speech, I would like to say to Mr. Baluk, you speak fantastic Ukrainian. Thank you very much indeed for that. You know that all of us, perhaps not all, but uh, a lot of us are um, in this transitioning from Russian to uh, Ukrainian. And when Paul speak a perfect Ukrainian, it's a very good motivation for many of us. Before we move on to our report, I would like to mention three important things for me. First and foremost, we as the Museum of the Voices of the um, Peaceful are moving to the number 100,000. We pay a lot of attention to quantity, but we are also not regarding quality. Why are we also focusing on quantity? I would like to excuse myself and justify myself for focusing exactly on that. It seems to us, just strikes us, that any history, any story matter, but the more such accounts we collect, the more voluminous will be the vision, the more complete and comprehensive of the things that have taken place. Secondly, oral story, uh, oral stories 
is a very um, modern method. It was started something like back in the 30s, 40s of the last century. So this method is about 70 years old. Nevertheless, at the time when all of us are media specialists in a way, this method is becoming, is gaining in greater popularity as the main source of truth. We remember that the truth, of course, is in many ways subjective. Therefore, when we speak about the main source of the truth, we mean that this is the core source of understanding what was going on. Does, this doesn't mean that this is crystal clear truth, that people will not be contributing something from, on, from themselves, but there are hundreds and thousands of such true stories to shape something that Mr. Valentin spoke about as a narr narrative. I was very much surprised that in America, the people that do interview, uh, that run such and manage such um, interviews are interviewers, and the people who do these interviews are narrators. They are called narrators because they narrate, tell, or share what eventually becomes narratives. Therefore, we treat oral stories as one of the core sources of the truth. Therefore, we are focusing on that. And thirdly, back in 2013 or 2014, I got to read a museum um, manifesto by a Nobel Prize winner who said that not only from the standpoint of uh, the oral story the narratives uh, play a significant role, but he said that the key museums and projects will have to be the ones that will put the human stories in the center. And if we get to see at what is happening right now in the world, in Poland, for example, there's a huge number of different museums focusing on the stories of common people. The same is taking place right now in Ukraine, like the Holodomor Museum. So a great number of things taking place is focusing exactly on that. Therefore, we are focusing on this too. We are hard proponents of that. We are committed and devoted to that, to this idea. That's why we allowed ourselves to run into this survey. Zhenya will show more about the methodology and the first two blocks, and I will uh, present the conclusions. Good afternoon. First of all, let me thank Natalia and the Foundation for inviting us to do this research because I really love my job. And I keep repeating that since the beginning of this war, I have been feeling the split uh, personality of mine because I'm traumatized just like everyone else in our country due to news and personal experience I have had. On the other hand, as a sociologist, I get to see so many different meaningful substantive processes unfolding right in front of our eyes because of the personalities of our friends, nearest and dearest. And what I'm going to present here to you today is very important because I'm sure that this allows us, due to these subjective stories, to convey uh, the um, core of big social movements happening right now. So this research is big and voluminous, as we have said. However, we'll try to present it to you in very concisely. The rest of the Aspects, of course, you will be able to consider in greater detail for yourselves. Let me just add, Jenya, it turned out that a great number of such a great amount of this information is still closed, concealed. Um, therefore, of course, this research is open, but we have also made a, an agreement that we will be making requests for big documentation initiatives concerning the other organizations' archives. You're, it's up to you whether you want to contribute or not. We will definitely add it. This is just an announcement to make. If there are any representatives of other documentation initiatives in our midst, that Gradus will be knocking on your door. Yes, Gradus will come and knock on your door requesting exactly that. So what did we do? We split our research into three big stages, first one being qualitative stage. We selected 10 experts from the industry, uh, from different documentation organizations, and we did in-depth interviews with them. The second was the quantitative, quantitative um, stage, and we spoke to more than a 1,000 re respondents, posters, both men and women, that live in different towns, cities, and villages. Uh, whose population is 50,000 plus in Ukraine. And thirdly, we analyzed open sources concerning 
the variety of organizations that function in this domain why and what they collect, how they proceed with the data gathered. In our presentation, uh, for the sake of our presentation, we mixed, we compared and collated all of this information in order to demonstrate a certain background of this industry how this industry makes its living nowadays. First of all, let me start with the definition of oral uh, story. And we came up with oral history. We came up with a pretty big paragraph from the perspective of our experts. And this is a certain human-centric research in its form, which has been prepared, recorded, and interpreted, preserved, and publicized according to a certain methodology and forms of documentation. And it can also be evidence-based as a historic source um, being based on a particular condition, and I will talk about it a, at a bit later point. And most of the time, it is based on people's accounts, stories, individual stories most of the time about uh, the people's traumatic experiences they have lived through regarding different historic events, uh, whether, them, uh, whether they would be past or running now. If this research covers a great variety of different experiences, eyewitnesses representing different viewpoints, it can aspire to objectivity and a certain descriptive strength or power of describing the event which is unfolding, for example, right now. Therefore, it can be considered to be an objective source of the truth. What are some of the characteristics of oral uh, stories, uh, narrations, something that has been characterized by all of the experts we have been in touch with? The first uh, basic value is the trust between the researcher and the narrator and the willingness of this narrator to share his or her traumatic experiences and to account the stories. Um, in this respect, a lot of different experts told us that a great number of people experience these um, narrations in a different way. They may be ready, may not be ready to account their stories, that people of uh, bigger towns are less willing to share than the dwellers of smaller residential areas or um, villages. So these are some of the conspicuous patterns that figure out. Secondly, all of the researchers seem to say that you have to consider the motives of the eyewitnesses, why they have decided to share their eyewitness accounts. And one of the most evident reasons for that is, of course, seeking justice because all of these people seek for the perpetrators, the culpable per persons to be brought to account. Third important requirements is the ethic approach to collecting this evidence. Everyone seems to reiterate that it's important not to re-traumatize the people who are eyewitness, eyewitnesses. And at the same time, it's important for the interviewers not to get traumatized because both of the parties invo are emotionally involved in these accounts. And lastly, the stories, uh, when proper methodological and uh, moral approaches are exercised, it can enable the storytellers to get rid of some negative emotions. So it has uh, curative and therapeutic effects. Overall, all of these accounts can split into three big clusters or blocks to be further disseminated or applied. First, this is the scientific domain. It's a big block to process the information, collect and collate, uh, document the historic reality. The second big block is the legal domain or paradigm. It's actually collecting all of this evidence in order to initiate uh, trials, run through them, and of course, be triumphant as a result of them. And the third domain within Ukraine and outside Ukraine for the big wide open world, scientific political discussions, museum projects, um, journalism activities, documentary filmmaking, therapeutic manifestations. All of these activities are running right now to help Ukraine to speak about their trauma, the Ukrainians' trauma, 
and to uh, share this trauma with the whole world. When speaking about the expert interviews, in-depth interviews, very provisionally, the experts can be divided into the group of methodologists and practitioners. All of them spoke about the same things in the final count. However, they stressed different things. Methodologists, for example, related more to the importance of the approach to documenting, engaging in the conversation, interviewing, documenting the evidence gained. Because methodology plays an important role. It should be preserved in order to later use this data to accumulate them and work with them. Then the ecological aspect for the witnesses, because the narrator and those who collect statements, since the war is ongoing and traumatic experience is ongoing, well, there's a certain, it's a bit unsafe for everyone. Also, they emphasize, emphasize the importance of um, collecting the data as fast as possible because otherwise this data would be lost and it will be pushed out of the memory. This traumatic experience is uh, erased in time. So they emphasize the importance of collecting that data as fast as possible and interviewing as many people as possible while the situation is ongoing and while the memory is still fresh. And practitioners that talked about that also focused on avoiding burnout of their team members, the interviews, because they found themselves in that uh, trauma field affected by the uh, people they interview. What affects the truth uh, from the expert's point of view? Well, the narrator and the context in the event, the role of the narrator the way the person perceived the event. The second thing is the mental state of the narrator during the interview, whether they are ready to talk about that. Then the value of the narrator, its purpose, and the skills of the narrator. Are they able to reflect on the experience and generalize that experience, consolidate and sum up this experience, and uh, are they? Do they tend to, you know, make some things up and uh, and expand that experience? The main challenge, from the point of view of these experts, is. They're creating narratives about the war, and that's historical responsibility and political responsibility and even military responsibility. Because all of these narratives can be used by the enemy. The main challenges are uh, the war is ongoing. It's not over yet, and this is why we need to be careful about collecting uh, statements and evidence, and uh, the narrators are still traumatized. There's a huge, a huge amount of work that needs to be done, and, and, and still we lack professionals that can collect that information. Different aspects uh, dealing with the collecting that stories, you can read more about that in the paper. But I will just focus on the uh, open data analysis. There are some organizations that collect and publish oral stories uh, within Ukrainian internet. There are 11 of these organizations. 
Well, that's not just that's not the full list. This is just organization that identify with you know collecting oral his history. That's right. Half of Ukrainians they heard something about that, and twenty percent of Ukrainians they like know something about these initiatives. The most famous is uh, National Memory Institute and the Center of Civil Liberties and Abom Media Agency, um, Civilian Voices Museum, uh, social media subscribers uh, rated these organization like the Museum for mm, uh, civilian uh, civilian voices museum and the Institute of uh, the national memory they are in the top three and I now I'm giving the floor to Natalia thank you very much as you see we can talk for hours but still we need to we need to we, we, we will publish that as soon as we have all of the information about the figures what people think about the importance of oral history, how important it is to document evidence of the witnesses of such important events. 85% of events of this war, almost 90%. So people mostly understand, most of the people understand why it's so important. And the personal experience is the following: 28% of respondents answers yeah, that yes, they um, made statements about this war. They were participants of the oral history project, and 38% of people know someone who participated in the narr narration of the oral history reason that all people from sharing their experience the biggest barrier is emotional exhaust exhaustion people are traumatized emotionally and the trauma is the main barrier and the, the f main factor is the sensitivity of certain things because people are not sure that they can talk about that like safety uh, it's not comfortable to talk about these things with uh, people they don't know so it's a trust thing um, they don't want to recall these things it relates to the first thing and also they're afraid of negative re reaction this is a gender distribution you can see that uh, m more men are ready to give their statements and emotionally it's easier for them than for women to talk about that at the same time for the question how necessary is to to talk about that to talk about full-scale war with uh, Ukrainians and other people so like do they understand the importance of uh, internal and external narratives there's no difference for them the possibility for them to talk about that here is the same as having a possibility to talk about that outside. And to sum it up, for the society, the documentation of history is important. And that's the good news. The good news is that we don't need to, uh, to run a promotion campaign. Uh, And it's very important for us to understand that. For us as practitioners, we need to understand that it should be safe, uh, it should be balanced, considering interests of both parties, the narrator, uh, and we need to use the right methodologies. It's one of the biggest challenges because lots of people collect evidence and they, they, they do their best. I mean, journalists, they do it like journalists and documentalists, like journalists. Or, Civil organizations do it like civil organization. People with war trauma do it like people with war trauma. But there should be a common ground about the methodology and safety. 
that should be we should be on the same page. It doesn't mean that somebody needs needs to come up with a set of rules. Just needs to be a certain shared knowledge. And this is a message from mass practitioners to the me people who deal with methodology. It's very important for us. While we have the capacity, we need to collect as much as possible. And how do you find the balance, the, those checks and balances between the meth methodology and the, the capacity and the volume? It, it, it's a matter of discussion. And it's very important that the oral history is a very effective tool to work with war traumas. We can't regard that as a, just a historical tool. During the war, our job is not just to not re-traumatize people. We need to regard this oral history tool as a big therapy practice. Well, this is a QR code, and um, it will be published online. Thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation. Since we are really out of time, I have a small housekeeping remark. We'll have two breaks. No, no, no. We have two networking zones, and we'll have a lunch break, and we'll have a small reception event after the forum so that you understand that there are panel discussions, but it mostly. Uh, one of the purposes is to promote your networking and discussions within, in between of these panels. Thanks a lot, Natalia. Thanks a lot for the information. Well, and uh, since I am engaged in the event as well, I have lots of questions. What to do with uh, these uh, emotional and mental shifts? How does the narrative? How is the narrative formed? What to do with that huge amount of information? There will be lots, uh, a lot of information here. So, what to do with it? And it's a great opportunity to learn. Thanks a lot for that opportunity. And I'm inviting the guests for the first po panel. How to? What are the? Uh, coping mechanisms, what are the mechanisms, other mechanisms, how it, does it affect the uh, our national memory, how does it affect war narratives, and this is what we're going to discuss during the first panel uh, in our forum when the experience becomes knowledge, and I'm ready to pass the mic to our panelists, to our moderator, professor of the Kiev National University. Uh, uh, of uh, Tara Shevchenko, Natalia Krivda. Natalia, the floor is yours. Thanks. That's a great responsibility. We'll uh, hit the ground running, and I uh, would like to re invite my guests. We have some people here, and some people are joining us online. Agata Tatarenko, head of the Visegrad Institute in Central Europe in Lublin, a member of a National Editing Commission of uh, Central European Un Institute publication. She will join us online. Anton Drobovich, head of the Institute of National Memory. Uh, he's a civil activist. And uh, personally, uh, well, I'd just li like to say that Anton is under rehabilitation. Just want to say great thanks to him. Uh, thanks for your service. Olga Opalenko, head of the evidence department on the Truth Hounds organization. They collect evidence of war crimes and uh, infringements of human rights in the context of the war in Ukraine. Thank you, Olga. Also, we are joined by offline by Yelena Grinchenko, uh, doctor of history, uh, um, a professor of and the head of the Oral History Association. Greetings, and Olena Dobrozhanko, candidate of political sciences, a pro-rector of Kiev National University, named after Tarashimchenko. 
It's 1.15 and uh, it should be a three round of questions. The first round is, uh, is about the statement. Professionals will talk about the methodology, vocabularies and some important things that define the framework, methodological framework of what we're going to talk about. The second round of questions will be dealing with the historical memory, how it's shaped and how our experience uh, traumas become knowledge and the third round of questions will be dealing with perspectives uh, the way our professionals view the potential of that practices of that shared memory I will start with uh, Galinada who's the head of the oral Ukrainian Oral History Association uh, well Galinada the floor is yours uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Thanks a lot. Hope you can see me in a way you can understand what I'm talking about. Thank you for the possibility to share your uh, scientific perspective, uh, perspective and your vision of our oral history. I will just draw your attention to the modern definition of that. And we have some interesting research, and now we'll talk about no challenges that we're facing today. Actually, this, this perspective will be based on our search in oral history, but I will also use different uh, scientific tools, uh, anthropology and other interview disciplines. I'm not sure if it will be very concise, but because it needs a lot of time for discussion. So the modern definition of the oral history, it's a recording memories about certain events using different methods. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that tragedy should not be a center of our oral history tradition. This is just our response to the reality uh, proposed to by the society to research the problem, but tragedy should not be the center of this oral history. It's a memory about the participation in certain events. It can be positive, not just a tragedy. Oral history is creation of new historical sources, and that's also important because the new historical source will be the framework that we will rely upon to build knowledge. Our oral history is analysis of the sources that we have got after the interviews. There are two main aspects, two different approaches with lots of options, but we can reconstruct different events or phenomenon, but we also can work with text and we can do a narrative analysis. We can work with text and its peculiarities. And finally, the oral history is different diverse forms of publishing research results. And it's a great perspective where we can talk about that and discuss that and we can comply with scientific methodology uh, of working with what we've collected. Also, we can use oppositions and provide a definition that will cover as much as possible. So the oral history is a process of interviewing and it's so also an interview product. Oral history is a document that requires scientific approach, and I will insist on that. It needs scientific approach. It needs <clears throat> lots of knowledge, and also it's a text, a certain reconstruction of memory uh, of uh, both parties during the interviews, the narrators and researchers. And finally, oral history is 
emotions of many people that are engaged in the interview. And so also it's a responsibility of one person, the researcher, that will give uh, that history a sense. And we will talk about that later, but now I would like to list main challenges that we face during different stages of the research. But I need to, I need to emphasize that. Shaping the research topic and the right wording is important. They have some uh, critical statements of that about how we shape that from the scientific point of view because uh, shaping our research is uh, relies on the results that we get, whether they're scientific, scientific or not. The situation or setting when we involve people to do interviews, it goes about helping being helped by every different representatives of other disciplines because this is right now during the war time. More often than not, people may require the assistance rendered by psychologists. So on the contrary, they may reject any assistance or help issued by a psychologist. And uh, people may very much be reluctant about being treated by someone who is a, a victim. Oral history, from my perspective, and I would like to focus your attention on that, has never been a therapy. It's just cre about creating documents and the whole sense of this therapy and versus making a document a stark difference. So how can they combine in one setting? Of course, it's a highly controversial question or issue. Of course, we have to be mindful of the original idea of oral history. It's all about establishing documents, archiving and access to the uh, archiving and access to this archive. So it's incredibly important. How are we archiving? Is there access provided to these archives? In what way do we offer the scientific and academic um, environment and setting to be familiarized with our archives? So this is incredibly important because it also has the elements of privatization dismissing others, uh, rejecting others and access. And on the other hand, it's also exposing the people that do the interviews and the interviewers to dangers. Also, but this can also become the basis for different o online ar archives, films, um, museum exhibitions. We all know about that. We are involved in these discussions. Sometimes there are wrongful claims that Films, for example, are claimed to be documentaries. We know what films are being talked about when they seem to be based on eyewitness accounts. But then eventually, th there is a lot of criticism about such films, uh, which is completely right. So here is the issue of the selection of the stories that we will be publicizing, making public. What kind of stories we will, will we be offering to the social, I wouldn't say, use but familiarization of the society and lastly something that I would like to stress is the private privatization and utilization how do we depart from that how can we diffuse the situation uh, make it safe for the science and academic circles in order not to utilize and not to build our academic or any other barriers, build any other barriers on the basis of these stories, not utilizing or exploiting human memories for our personal interests. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. So we take it into our discussion and scientific discuss some of the interesting statements. So Mr. Antono, it's your three minutes. First of all, I would like to thank very much the organizers for holding this forum for with the, with the possibility of the multidisciplinary communication, the uh, adjacent different disciplines, and I would like to thank you f from myself for doing this research. And it's going to be very helpful to multiple actors. I would like to us to start with the key question that the moderator has posed and the organizers have posed. 
how to transform this experience into knowledge. So this is a very interesting experience. And in essence, here we are speaking about what Gerena de Grinchenka, the professor, has spoken about. If you adhere to the methodology, comply with the methodology, then an oral account can be transformed into scientific knowledge if this is done properly. However, if we get to see at the variety of oral experiences and documentation and recording of this experience, I single out four forms. Um, of such where well, oral history is just one of these forms. So depending on the application of the methodology when working with people, we can talk about four forms, at least four forms, of recording historical accounts, oral accounts. So first it's the oral story itself and transforming into his oral history. It's a unit of historical science. When applying a certain methodology, we can transform an oral narration of an individual and transform that into a historical document. Once once again, complying with all of the rules of the game. And here, an oral story is one, or oral history is one of the uh, studies. So this is a full-fledged scientific discipline. The second form of recording this experience, which I would single out in the space and context of our experience, is journalism. We can see journalism. Um, investigations by Washington Post and Wall Street Journal or the Ukrainian Truth, which enables the people who are survivors, get combatants, sex combatants to speak the truth, to tell the truth. So this is the second f form of speaking about the facts of history. The, se the third one is to do with justice. When prosecutors or researchers collect or representatives of uh, various legal international institutions or tribunals collect these eyewitness accounts in line with the international uh, procedure, so this gains the third form. Then they are not just oral stories. But all of these become testimonies and testimonials in legal trials, so feel the difference. The experience transforms into academic exp um, knowledge, experience transforming into journalism facts, and experience uh, turning into uh, justice accounts. And the fourth thing is art in a broad variety of understanding, ranging from literature and poetry about some genocide, annihilation activities, to memoir keeping. And here, cinema, uh, painting, cinematography, and photography in many ways can also be reflective of um, and conveying the uh, experiences of the people. And of course, this is the least objective. So these are the four forms of working with oral stories. And I would like to thank the organizers of this forum because we get to see how broad is the framework and different adjacent points involved in that. I'm a representative of the Institute of National Memory, which works in three uh, dimensions. The archiving of oral history. We have Tatiana Kovtunovich, uh, who is in charge of this area of work in my institution. In line with the historic methodology, uh, we have been in consultations with the institutions responsible for shaping this methodology. Part of the people, unfortunately, right now in temporarily occupied territories, and we cannot represent and publicize the information of, of their eyewitness accounts. The second is the Virtual Museum of the Russian Aggression. It's our initiative. It's the journalist, um, human rights activists, uh, CSO's initiative which targets the first first hand information and involvement so we're just ushering a pathway into this domain and lastly it's art on the basis of oral stories we have already um, initiated several documentaries about volunteers, about uh, the girls who suffered in captivity. Some of them have already become the winners of Shevchenko National Prizes. Some of them have become an experience for surviving this experience in living them um, when hearing it from other people. We will definitely forward the information to the organizers of this forum in, from our archive. This is incomparable to the amount of the information, to the error of the information collected by uh, the voices of the peaceful. But the last remark to make, we must be always keenly aware that memory is always subjective, selective, emotional, unreliable, 
and is never fully objective. So the methods that we apply when selecting different eyewitness accounts in all of these four, perhaps not to the least extent, they are su supposed to be uh, selected in order to mitigate the effects of selectiveness and all of the other aspects that I have mentioned. So the larger is the area of memories, and the greater is the variety of memories, the more is this desperation to objectivity. I'm very happy, and it greatly comforts me that this is how we are beginning to stress and highlight uh, this experience concerning the truth so that our children and our children's children will have a greater understanding of what we are going through right now. Thank you, Anton. Now, Ms. Alona, please. Thank you all. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the organizers and uh, the fellow panelists. I would like to take a slightly different perspective of the topic. It strikes me that legitimizing oral history itself is only possible in a democratic society. Because hearing, being willing to hear, and being able to say is only possible where humans are respected. And nowadays we get to see that this common people is not appreciated by our enemy, let alone the voices of these common people. And the attempt to collect such eyewitness accounts amongst Ukrainians matters enormously. But we are also faced with new threats discussed today, and which I will also broach on what exactly will be transformed into the level of the national narrative, what will become our country's narrative especially conditioned by the fact that the war is still going on and the enemy is still shaping uh, his own enemy. So we are living in these two parallel realities. The government always shapes the narrative of the winner. And the individual narrative of an eyewitness I fully agree, is not necessarily to speak about trauma, but as a rule, something that we are confronted with is all fraught with trauma. So this governmental victorious narrative of the country of Ukraine will heavily depend on what the end of this war will be for the Russian Federation, whether it will have to be prosecuted for the atrocities that it has committed, she committed, and then we will be able to present our victorious narrative, and Russia will be defeated with all of its old array of narratives. When, it, when she said that uh, she is the heir to the Russian Empire, to the Soviet Union, not being willing to uh, be responsible for all of the atrocities and crimes committed in those days in those ages. I'm a representative of the National Shevchenko Kiev University. We have our own professionals and we are appreciative of Renat Akhmetov's foundation for combining, uniting these efforts, especially these academic and scientific efforts. And as a result of these effort application, we will present an interesting guide. It will be published closer to the end of this year right now. Our university has its own specific experience of shaping this oral history based on eyewitness accounts. We have set up a memorial of um, the people, uh, the faculty members of National Shevchenko University that have perished as a result of this war. We do interviews with our family members, uh, students, relatives, fellow university f um, faculty members, and we unfortunately get to see that the number of these accounts is growing. And what are we to do with this great, great number of uh, narratives, whether it's going to be kept individual and whether it will be at, uh, at cross uh, ends with our state and other enemy narratives is still a big question. Thank you very much. Now the floor goes to Ms. Olga. I'm much appreciative of this in invitation. It's a great comfort for me that the academic and scientific community are paying attention to this problem and issue. It's not a secret that a lot of CSOs and NGOs are have been documenting and applying documentation initiatives for nine and a half years, nearly 10 years. Why am I here? First of all, 
I'm a very much grateful gratitude of Taras Shevchenko National University, a historian, where I studied the discipline of oral history as an undergraduate. Since the commencement of the war back in 2014, I have been applying all of this knowledge gained in practice in one of the human rights advocacy organizations, building on the principles of documentation and applying every effort so that these scientific principles and methodologies should be applied for the sake of uh, proper operations of uh, NGOs and SEOs. I'm here to represent Truth Hounds, an organization which is documenting everything happening in Ukraine since 2014. And we have already been on more than 200 field missions, and we have collected more than 5,000 eyewitness accounts. All of these accounts have been kept and archived, and I hope I will be able to share in greater detail how we are going about that. Our organization perhaps may seem to be standing aside of the oral history as a science. Why? Because we specialize in filling in gaps and lacunes uh, in investigation, trials and in, in prosecution investigations. We have requests from them. And at their request, we undertake not investigative operations, so it would be improper to say that, but we begin to investigate certain incidents working in the field, thus helping the prosecution in Ukraine. And the main principle of our work is the principle do not harm. And in this respect, we are significantly difficult, different from investigative bodies. Our methodology uh, is quite different. All of our actions are aimed at building very comfortable, soft, co uh, convenient setting for the eyewitnesses to begin to overcome the effects of their traumas. One of the rules, by the way, that we exercise at the end of every interview, we read the text that we have recorded to the eyewitness saying, I, and we are sure that this practice will enable them to um, begin to tackle and handle the effects of their traumas. We are keenly aware that there is a great number of public organizations that unfortunately do not comply, do not meet the standards. During the time of my work, I have been working a lot of CSOs, NGOs, as a documentarian and in a material positions. I have also been lucky to work in the presidential administration during uh, the prisoner exchanges where I had to organize documentation initiatives for the people that had just returned from captivity. And therefore, I have the vision of how these initiatives are built and constructed in different organizations. So I'm very much aware of the quality of these processes depending on the organizations managing them. Therefore, it's incredibly valuable to create such platforms, such facilities like this forum in order to unite their efforts and reach better results and um, in improve the quality of our work. Thank you very much. And now we would like to give the floor to Ms. Agatha. Uh, you speak Ukrainian, don't you? We also have the interpretation into English enabled for your kind invitation and I apologize for not speaking in Ukrainian even if my uh, surname says uh, otherwise. Um, first, of all, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very strict about the definition of uh, oral history and uh, for me oral history is the research uh, method um, but also some kind of interpretation of the collected uh, testimonies. And um, as Professor uh, Grichenko said, uh, oral history connect different kind of discipline like history, sociology, anthropology. And uh, there is like one um, perspective that connects all of this uh, oral history uh, re research. And this is the perspective of the people who experience um, 
events or, uh, for example, like, like as we speak uh, during uh, forum, uh, the war. So uh, I think that um, oral history is an interview which is connected in a certain way story project that are conducted during the war in Ukraine. I think that uh, the first time in history uh, of oral uh, history research, uh, we deal with the situation that uh, testimonies are collected during the experience and during the event that they are about. Uh, if so, uh, it is. I think it's important to ask the question if we still can use this uh, name of oral history, or should we think about some kind of uh, different uh, perspective or maybe uh, different uh, methodology? Because um, uh, in the past, in the uh, we, if, if we are thinking about the oral history res research, in the past they were uh, rather about a certain event from the um, time perspective, like few years or um, in some example of, for example, during the uh, the Second World War, there is like a great uh, period of uh, time perspective. And in the Ukrainian case, it's uh, the ongoing event. So uh, I know that this is a very sensitive uh, problem um, because uh, of the um, importance of the of the research and the importance of this collect of collecting testimonies. But uh, my concern and something that I'm thinking about uh, when I'm thinking about the the this, uh, projects, different projects. Uh, in uh, ongoing now in Ukraine, uh, I'm thinking mostly about the methodology and also about the ethics of uh, this uh, research, because as you already said, um, I think that uh, all of you uh, mentioned about this, uh, this is a very sensible problem and also we deal with a lot of trauma. So. Uh, I think that uh, the ethics and the methodology problems uh, are uh, supposed to be considered maybe once again. And that I have in mind, for example, the experience of researchers who deal with uh, also a kind of similar problems, uh, which means the, the war in the Balkans in the 90s. And uh, there were also a lot of, of consideration about the ethics and the methodology because of the war uh, trauma of the uh, people who experience and who gave the testimonies. Uh, so this is my perspective, and uh, as um, I didn't say that at the beginning, uh, but uh, I'm not. Um, I don't have any experience in the collecting of the testimonies uh, from the Ukrainian uh, war now, the war in Ukraine, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm rather the uh, methodologist uh, of oral history and history, but uh, I also conducted some kind of um, oral testimonies, but they were not uh, about war. Sometimes they were, but mostly they were about the communism. So this is why I am um, talking mostly about the ethics and the methodology, because this is close to my field of research. Thank you very much. Thank you and so I much. Thank you so much. It was very interesting and important for us. Hopefully everyone had a translation and you could hear that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we are falling behind the schedule and this is a second round and you talk about things that are important for you professionally. When we discussed, uh, when we talked about the previous discussion with the panelists, we uh, mentioned terminology and I suggested certain terms like communicative memory and cultural memory, three generation cultural memory. And cultural memory is this specific narrative that has been shaped, that has been collected, and this is our shared collective uh, cultural memory. Helenada uh, suggested another terms, more terms like archive and canon. 
and uh, they suggested that they don't use oral history. It's not yet a history, it's our everyday life. So documentation initiatives uh, as a term was what was suggested later. And it's about the policy that we're shaping why war experience become knowledge and how this knowledge, and this is what I'm concerned with, becomes or doesn't become that tool, a criteria to form national identity. Or So the, does the Trump consolidate the nation or the other way around? So this is the second round about the memory policy, about the, the policy of getting and uh, why you think this experience is important. We don't have much time. Let's talk about your uh, view on the perspective of that area. And let's have the same um, sequence. And Galinada, if you are here with us, so we will be happy to listen to you. Yeah, I'm here with you. And I'm really interested, and I would like to express my gratitude to Agata Tatarenko for speaking about things that we are dealing with. Yes, what we are dealing with is not it's not basically oral history. It's not really history. It's just recording certain aspects of an ongoing event. And oral history deals with events in the past. The past experience that was incorporated in, in the understanding of the everyday life. I'm sorry for using these uh, strictly scientific terms, but this is what I've decided to be a part of a um, scientific discourse. So this is what I will stick to. And what we're dealing with is not really uh, no oral history. It's not oral history at all. The documenting an ongoing event and we don't know how it ends and we talk about ethics and ethics is something that is uh, very basic and fundamental ethics is the most important thing that we should uh, think about and we when we say that we are looking for the right terms, the right approaches to the analysis for publishing this information, how to build the knowledge. That's fundamental for me as a historian, very fine testimonials. And comparing information, analytical work, because oral history is not just um, just recalling the the memory. It's not just saying this is truth. This is not. This researcher's job is to verify, is to explain and expect, and 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 suggest a result of analytical work because we need to analyze that. We need to understand why the person chose that narrative, and even if they spoke didn't. Sp big truth for me as a historian even when people are not speaking the truth because there is a reason for them to not speak the truth for some reason they chose to you know chose that experience there is a reason why they build the narrative like that and there are different things that determine our narrative starting with people will respond to as uh, researchers. I mean, there are situations that, uh, well, well there, there can't be a situation where, where you offer people something in exchange for the narrative. So people, sometimes people are just responding to the environment when, 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 when they are sharing their experience. And our job as um, researchers is to understand what is the reason for that person uh, st speaking about that? Why they represent this particular social uh, group? Why they are building their narrative like that? And this is what I would like to talk about: the responsibility. And it's also a very sensitive thing for me. It also deals with ethics because it mostly relates to us, not 
the person we interview. We mostly talk about our the people that we interview. Oh, sorry, I think we lost the connection. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, I lost. Okay, I think I got it. So, researchers, ethics, there are questions that we need to ask ourselves. When we go in the field, we need to ask ourselves, why I'm doing that? And what resources, what capabilities do I have? Can I... Uh, I'm not prepared to for, for that uh, stress. Uh, it, maybe I'm just tired and I will look away. And maybe I'm hiding my thoughts because I'm I'm afraid that they will, you know, see what I'm thinking about. Or maybe I'm about to record more interviews. I'm looking up. I'll watch. Maybe I'm, you know, searching for something in my pocket to you know motivate the person I'm interviewing. The second question is: Do I have the right to talk on the behalf of the narrator? Because after we record it, we're going to tell the story publicly. Who am I to do that? Do I have the right to speak on behalf of the narrator? What perspective should I choose to speak on behalf of him or her? And the third question, let's ask ourselves. So people are sharing their experience. Who am I for them and why am I using that, misusing that possibility? as an outsider or insider. That's my last position. I can talk about that for hours. We can we can sit here for weeks, uh, and I don't want that. But the last question, who am I for that community? Do I have any knowledge about their experience? Uh, can I use, can I, can I extrapolate on my experience? Why do I think that I have the right to record that uh, statement, that account? And, um, I will be happy to join you if you talk about that later. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Can I just answer the questions about the national memory, about how this miracle happens, how a certain experience of uh, people in the community is turned into national memory, the public narrative of the national memory, an official narrative, a non-official narrative of the national memory. It's a bit of a philosophical question. You, we need to use methodology, phenomenology, and s psychological analysis, anthropology, of course, social anthropology. So I'm happy that we have some knowledge and philosophy and we have professional from uh, historians that will allow us to stay in the line. There are four different areas where uh, we document things during the war, the oral history or history, art, journalism and justice. And as Professor Grinchenko said, there is a methodological problem in documenting events that are ongoing. So we I have professionals, my colleagues, that documented the revolution of dignity, and they used historical oral methodology. They, they learned about that. They studied that, and they used that historical methodology. No question about that. That's historical methodology. The event is over. But it's a good question. If we're using the same methodology, same professionals that uh, collect evidence, they turn some people's experience into scientific knowledge. What is the status of this result, of this scientific knowledge, if the event is ongoing? Because we don't comply with the methodological requirements, as Mr. Grichiko says. That's very important for the history. This is why we are on the no man's land. And we will find the proper term for that later and our the future generations will find out how do you approach documenting a non-going event is this something new did we comply with the canon and that's a very interesting question the second thing 
journalism. It uh, turns into a into a, a story, a publicity story, a novel. And this is the product, the product of um, justice study is a procedural evidence that can be used in court. That's the product. So first we have no, uh, scientific knowledge. We turn it into a, a story, into a novel, then we turn it into evidence that can be uh, accepted in court. So four different products. The interesting question is all of this can be used to form national memory. There are two different actors, the state, uh, the government that chooses what the official narrative should be in the society that operates with stories and knowledge and they say we can't forget that if they write a book about that about that event and it becomes uh, a sensitive thing for the society they can't forget about that they can't help but speaking about that this is why society chooses the book uh, because they want to keep the memory alive somebody writes a paper based on uh, archive data uh, judicial proceedings data and this scientific study becomes uh, an object for the state to justify the official uh, memory. This is how it happens with these four different products. Oral history, uh, pieces of art and uh, judicial statements. And the society makes a choice as a, as a civil society and as a, as a state like uh, authorities and the government and our job is to make sure that um, that they don't choose uh, fake art or fake statements or propaganda because the this will always be the case the temptation will be strong and sometimes there will be a temptation to say that uh, the governmental agencies were angels or the, the representatives of the states were angels. They were, were ideal. So we need to use scientific knowledge if we need to be objective, if we uh, if we need uh, judicial statements we need to avoid fakes because they form wrong uh, memory and our job as a society is to make sure that everything works properly so that we can form our memory so they can we can form our history uh, out of true things real uh, pieces of art scientific knowledge real and just evidence based on uh, journalist research or journalist standards and uh, this will help us become a healthy society but the greatest mystery related to the oral history what we're doing at the end of the day we are using oral history standards uh, on an ongoing event and the question is uh, is it legit and this is why I'm thankful to Agatha and Helenanda for pointing that out so we can uh, really be engaged in the creation of a new phenomenal new phenomenon phenomenon thank you thank you sincerely uh, hopefully it's been recorded and then we will transcribe uh, everything that's uh, being discussed because uh, what you say is very extremely important thank you very much thanks and I would like to follow up on that I talked about that during the first speech. The history is not over. And as Renas once said, that consolidation is a part of us, and uh, it's it's a it's a shared glory in the past. And there is a fear that this individual narrative of a witness, combined with a huge amount of uh, information that is being collected. Some uh, were complied with the methodology, some didn't, and um, 
The question is how it will be turned into a national narrative or a state narrative, into a narrative that has risks. We have some risks uh, to turn into Belarus or Russian Federation because we should make sure that the propaganda doesn't replace the history for us. And this is how the discussion happens. We talk about that publicly, and the fact that we talk about that together with different historians, psychologists, and communication specialists, journalists, representatives from art, uh, art community, and civil activists, they are the filters that will um, prevent us from turning into uh, propaganda narratives with uh, uh, fake characters. It's like they say, we can repeat that. And the older generation faced the situation where you understand that everything that you remember it is not your primary memory. This is a memory of your fathers and grand grandparents. It was uh, affected by the Soviet education. And the heroes that you learned about are like lots of them, they didn't exist. And it became this a part of this uh, propaganda narratives. When we need to avoid that, we're fighting Russian narratives, but we need to make sure that we don't become them. And the problem will be resolved after the war is over. And uh, and, and and we need to understand how it ended for Russia and how it ended for Ukraine. Я маю абсолютно непохитно жорстку позицію, що ні, це не є усно історичне інтерв'ю. Чи то мої викладачі були такими строгими, да, жорсткими, чи то це притаманно суто мені. Але всі мої команди чітко знають, що ми не робимо усно історичних досліджень. Це неможливо. Ми, суто ми. Можливо, тому що ті люди, з якими ми зустрічаємось в полях, це безумовно люди в стані гострого стресу. Тут мови не, бути, мови не може бути про те, що це є наукове інтерв'ю. Але... We, it's impossible to say that this is scientific interviews, but I'm conscious of the fact that the array of the sources that we are collecting is an incredible wealth for the future historians. And let me get across to you one important point. When working for different organizations, I experienced different attempts of setting up a coalition of different uh, public organizations. I'm very much hopeful that this kind of a coalition will be set up amongst academics, but it will be a success, what Madam Galenada said right from the start about the um, as seeking to privatize one's collections. This is probably the greatest impediment for our joint efforts in shaping national memory based on all of the things that Mr. Anton has just mentioned. I can't say that unlike other organizations, this will be too strict to say not all organizations tend to privatize uh, their collections, but we are definitely appealing with everyone to share your experiences, your sources with each other. Moreover, we have our own database, which is used by the International Criminal Court, and it is equipped with a toolkit so that nowadays and would-be researchers can work with it. We also have a signed special permit for the application of uh, uh, this information to be able to utilize our archives. And we sincerely seek cooperation in this respect. So far, we haven't started cooperation with any institutions yet, except the Hoover University, if I 
have named it correctly. We are also making audio recordings like many other organizations. We are collecting various materials like books, manuscripts, diaries, uh, photo imagery, etc. All of that is extremely valuable. And I sincerely hope to cooperate. Please reach out to us so that we can also share our database with you because it enables you in split seconds to locate the information necessary for researchers, screen everything based on topic, time, frames. So it enables you a lot of freedom. Different constructs are possible, and you can even build your own uh, cloud storages within this database. So we are open for cooperation. And I very much hope for future communications with you. Thank you. This is the most powerful for all conferences, for me at least, is the opportunity to go for practical realms. So, um, Agatha, please, you're welcome. I would like to answer the part of your question about the politics of uh, commemoration, the politics of memory. But before I jump to that, I would like to really quickly refer to your statement about how or if the trauma integrate the society. And I think uh, it is, and uh, we can see on the example from Central Europe that this is very dangerous processes, and uh, mostly we can observe it on the example of Hung Hungary and uh, also the uh, situation between Hungary and Ukraine now during the ongoing uh, uh, war. So this is very dangerous uh, processes, in my opinion, the, how trauma integrate the society. And uh, if we speak about oral history and how it became uh, the part of collective memory about certain um, events, we deal with some kind of paradox. Uh, oral testimonies has to be used in a certain way, uh, often with the uh, top-down uh, interpretation. And uh, this is in juxtaposition with the very core of oral uh, history that uh, Professor Gimchenko has been talking about, the perspective of the person who told her his uh, story, her or his tr uh, truth. Uh, in some way, it is a very uh, disturbing uh, statement and the dangerous result of this kind of uh, using documented uh, or documented life stories we can observe, for example, uh, in Russia, in the uh, politics of memory of Russia, which use also the um, uh, personal life uh, stories in its uh, politics of memory. And uh, the documented stories, uh, the involvement of the documented stories, of the oral history stories in the building of collective memory about a certain event depends from how the uh, testimonies uh, are used and where. And we can see from the different research from oral, uh, from, from Central Europe, from example, in Poland, uh, we had the research uh, about uh, where people gained the knowledge about the past, and the result was mostly the museum. And in Central Europe, in Poland, in uh, Czech Republic, in Slovakia, and also in the Hungary, we can observe that uh, oral, maybe not only oral, but in general, life stories, uh, they, are, they have very important place in the museums. So if we are talking about this uh, politics of memory and uh, the involvement of the life uh, stories in the collective memory, I think uh, we should also uh, take on the perspective the, the museums or the places of uh, memory in this uh, modern uh, definition. 
And uh, if we, for example, uh, see the, the case of Poland uh, and oral history and how it became a part of, uh, of this uh, national uh, narrative, for example, about the uh, Warsaw Uprising. The Museum of uh, Warsaw Uprising in Warsaw has had, had a very important role. And uh, if we enter to the museum, the first uh, thing we see at the exposition, and ac actually the, the telephone installation, when we can um, hear the, the testimonies from the person who fought in the uh, Warsaw uh, uprising. So uh, to sum up, I, and to sum up this uh, perspective from the involvement uh, of the uh, life uh, stories uh, in the collective memory, I think it's very important to set that they are not enough, even if it's, as I said, some kind of said statement and they have to be used in a certain way. But this is also very important once again to uh, to analyze uh, the, the collected materials with this perspective of person who told uh, his uh, or her story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, dear colleagues, thank you very much, Agatha. Now we have. 13 minutes left. Dear fellow panelists, I would like each of you to speak for two minutes about the prospects, challenges, prospects, something still meaningful which stays, which our audiences have to, uh, to live with, something to conceptualize. So the conclusions, summary, and prospects. So let's start with Madame Gerenada, if you may. Thank you very much indeed. I think it will be shorter than two minutes. We have to keep learning, keep reading scientific literature, and not stop at just thinking ourselves 100% experts. We're still in the field of research, searching for the answers. And let me reiterate it again. Scientific knowledge, it seems to me, it's very much wanted, and it has to be focal. It has to be at the center of this initiative. That's all from me. Thanks a lot. Anton, please. Yes, I will also try to be brief, and if there is some more time, I will not object to un questions from the audience. So the same narration as Professor Grinchenko has just said. We have to make every effort and take it very seriously to make to make sure that a spade is called a spade, that money is allocated to science and attention is given to that so that experts are not deprived of the right to exert influence on any scientific, um, governmental decisions. The agenda of the state, the budget of the state needs to take into account the voices of the professionals and initiatives that have, al have already proven with their real work, their capacity and efficiency. We have a list of these initiatives, the research has demonstrated that to us, the people who are working. So these people need to be entitled to articulate their voices and uh, to have a share of the res resources allocated in their favor. And then I think we will reach the common order. Thank you. Ms. Olena, please. Thanks. Um, I would also like to draw your attention to what's happening these days. It's so new to us so. However, we have this experience of professionals, how Ukrainian national professionals, also international experience, although this is completely unrivaled and extraordinary because the event is still ongoing. We have to unite, learn, and teach others. And it seems to me that all of these initiatives of the research presented uh, uh, to us today, uh, it's very important for us to do networking, establish communications. And this communication needs to be established between scholars, academics, representatives of different institutions, so that this contributes to shaping a real potent strength and power to enable Ukraine to be victorious and to come up with the t um, narratives that we will never uh, be embarrassed about. Thank you for the microphone. Once again, I appeal with you to go for cooperation. I know that sometimes executive authorities are slow, academic institutions are wise, and they exercise 
uh, valid approaches. But once again, now and today, I propose that we shouldn't uh, delay it any longer and go for cooperation. Thank you ever so much. Now, uh, Madam Agatha, if you please. Uh, kind of difficult to speak the last one because uh, I would be very happy to repeat all of the statement because I am I, I agree with them uh, with all of you. I would like just to add that I think it's very important to find your own perspective, which is uh, connected to your aim, and uh, we can talk about uh, the oral history in the perspective of science, of uh, research from the uh, his of, of the history field, the sociology, anthropology, but also from the public history. And I think what is the most important for you is uh, the perspective of the public history. And so it's, in my opinion, it's also uh, important to seek the experience from other countries who dealt with the similar problem. And if I am thinking about uh, your work, which is really, really, really important, and uh, it's difficult to, to find the words to, to, to stress how important it is, uh, I would see that uh, in Balkans they um, conduct also uh, very important uh, oral history research from important from the uh, point of view of the society. So, uh, as I said, and I will just repeat, it's important to find your own perspective and to see the experience uh, from another country. And I would say that maybe the Balkans would be helpful because they also dealt with this uh, trauma and uh, uh, the oral uh, sources, the life stories connect, uh, uh, collected with the uh, oral history method was also used in the persecution. So yeah. thank you very much for your, your invitation. Thank you so much that you have opportunity to to part in it. Thanks a lot. Uh, now, as the moderator, I would also like to say a few things and quote um, Ernest Ernan, who has been quoted here today in the history of a community, stored not only the heroic memory past the great people and glory, but also numerous victims, sorrow and grief. They consolidate a society and uh, shape the positive understanding of uh, the nation and determine the vision of this nation for the future. My deep conviction is that everything that we are doing today, both in the academic um, environment, uh, government institutions, which are called to do that in public organizations and uh, different forums, in all of these realms and activities, we are doing it all for the sake of the future, for the vision of the future, for shaping ourselves and the perspectives on ourselves as a powerful U European nation which is surviving and will definitely will survive this trauma to come out stronger and be present in the European history as a dignified, victorious nation. So the scale. I suppose has to be borne in mind all the of the time, uh, the because the prospects of the future, uh, the perspectives on the few past very much determined our visions of the future. It was a real honor for me to moderate this panel. Thank you all present here with me. You cannot imagine we still have six minutes less left. Do you have any questions in the audience? May I please grab the mic, please, and immediately say who you want to ask this question. Of. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this substantive and meaningful discussion. In the first place, I would like to comment on. You see, I'm a, uh, an author of People at War project, and what I have heard is extremely helpful and useful for me, and I would like to follow up on what Mr. Anton has said that we are within this context and we cannot comply 100% with this methodology. But my question is why are we doing this? On the one hand, there is this national memory that we want to shape, as it seems to us, and we want to uh, defend it, because it's, it's my uh, sensation from everything that I have heard, because we want to stand up for it, because we have gained this experience, because it's something that others wanted 
to deprive us of. And on the other hand, we are in a situation, you, Madam Natalia, have said about that. There are already textbooks on history being published. The war is not over yet. And still we have history books issued by the enemy who is shaping these new narratives. So now that we are at war, the war for reality, if you enter any shop in Vienna or Berlin, you have a nearly z next to nothing number of books. And best case, there will be a book authored by Mr. Plehi, a general history. But this is a fantastic choice. I can tell you that the choice is really limited. And we will be talking to the Russian liberals. We will be on the same wave length wavelength with them. So it means that right now we have to explain ourselves to others, not just commenting and saying that this textbook is wrong or this film about Bucha is not proper or accurate, because we will still be sinking in different narratives and they will be countering to us saying, wow, they're lying. So we have to shape these narratives. I think it's an answer to what we are busy d b with right now. This was a remark, not a question. I have a specific question. I don't know who to ask. Maybe Mr. Anton, maybe more. Ola said, let's unite. Does it mean that at a particular point we will set up a common archive or there will be some rules of exchange established of information because, once again, there is a huge number, area of different testim testimonies. So who will be collating, uniting all of that? What does the state have to think about it in other places? And if you have to, so then how? Well, personally, I think if we're talking about specifically about war, the government is suggesting the creation of this national peace center or whatever they call this organization and they should accumulate uh, consolidate all the materials that have some legal meaning and not just that that would tell the story that would be wise to do uh, as far as the oral history goes the digital archive we have some experience where we incorporate materials if they comply with the methodology if they were collected correctly we can include them if uh, if it's a state archive that deals with all of us there are if we're talking about the oral history if the if it complies with the standards we are ready to accept that and it should be so if we talk about the war well we can uh, address that peace center and they have they, they planned to uh, create two uh, museums of war and this is where it should be, this is where it belongs what is the role of the academy academia the universities play a very prominent role in that yes absolutely this is what Volodymyr said we have tools and ways to create these narratives um, publications pieces of art and uh, products of uh, legal evidence we have a we may have a methodological problem with oral history but nobody prevents us from writing something like Babin Yar novel uh, by Kuznetsov we can write a novel about Bucha nobody prevents us for that, from that and this is, will be a narrative location it's not about our discussion it's about that experience if it becomes a prominent novel it's that will do the job but we need to collect memories uh, and they should be corrected properly and they should be made accessible to inspire uh, writers and as far as the academy go this national peace center they need to have powerful uh, uh, supervisory boards and they should make sure that they don't step uh, you know the line and powerful research capacities that should be available for these institutions and the time is up just a few things very important Anton I think what all actors lack 
in this process is a powerful message from state institutions. Stating, well, they need to give an impetus to that process. To my shame, I didn't know about these institutions you talked about. Right. Thank you. Well, let's say this is the first powerful step towards this direction. Thank you very much to all of the participants. Agata Tatarenko, head of the Visegrad Group of the Central European Institute, Anton Drobovich, head of the National Memory Institute, Olga Opolenko, head of the Evidence uh, Department in Truth Hounds, uh, Helena Dagrinchenko, Association of Oral History, Elena Dobrozhanka, Pro-Rector of uh, Shevchenko uh, State University, and me, Natalia Krivda. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Natalia, I would like to express my gratitude to you for great focus and for uh, fantastic timing. That's very important nowadays when we have uh, people joining online from other continents all over the world. And now we have a small break until 2.20 cave time. We have some time for coffee for a warm-up and for networking because this is what the organizers are emphasizing discussion panels it's a, it's a place in time where you get information that you can discuss and ask question about during the informal conversation time that will be your starting point for further cooperation uh, let's be back here at 2.20 Ми бачили те, чого ніколи не забудемо. Те, що ніхто не має права забувати. Музей голосу мирних фонду Ріната Ахметова найбільше у світі колекції історії українців, що постраждали від агресії Росії. Розповідай, дивись, пам'ятай.
Дорогі друзі, я буду пропонувати всім тим, хто вже допив каву і чай, займати свої місця у залі, тому що ми будемо буквально за хвилинку розпочинати. Дорогі друзі, бачу, що задум організаторів спрацьовує, що неформальне спілкування відбувається. Well, I can see that the networking is going on and trying to look for approaches for cooperation. How can you bring together the academical practice? Uh, how can you work with an event that is ongoing, a traumatizing event, but we can continue that informal um, discussion after the next break, during the lunch break. But now I would like to invite you, please take your seats in the room. And now there's another keynote speech ahead during our forum and this also we're having a second discussion panel that is called oral history task roles and problems I think I saw Anton Lagusha so in order to present the second keynote speaker of our forum while Anton is on his way to the stage, I would like to emphasize uh, uh, some part of his uh, autobiography. I'm sorry for uh, speaking about you uh, in a third person. Anton Legush is a candidate of his history, a uh, public uh, researcher of history. He's from Donetsk region. And in before 2022, he worked in the USA in George Mason University, where he taught public history and media. After the full-scale invasion started, Anton got back to Ukraine, and right now he uh, leads a conflict and memory study program in Kiev School of Economy. This educational area is very important for us. There doing a very important thing and his topic is strategies of war documentation uh, power content and evidence can I switch slides over here <clears throat> okay I have another device that I have to load. Thank you for uh, the possibility to be here. And before I start, I will just uh, make two uh, statements. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for such a important but complicated forum where you can uh, use different perspective talking about the war. And I'm not the only one here. 
uh, I have a whole team from the Skip School of Economy of the first master's program about the study of a public memory that works in the Kiev School of Economy. I wanted to start from a story that happened with my close friend on the 24th of February. Actually, it was it happened before that. So in 20. 2nd of uh, February, uh, the, my friend is an IDP after 2014, he was relocated from uh, Donetsk and his parents still live there. On the 22nd of uh, uh, February, his grandma died in the evening and it turned out that my friend was the only one to bury her. So he had to go to back to Kramatorsk in the eastern Ukraine and he uh, you know, orders this all relevant services on the 23rd of uh, February. He reached Kramatorsk on the 24th. This is where the funeral service had to happen. So he took his girlfriend, and on the 24th of February, the war started. In the morning, Kramatorsk was shelled, and they said at the morgue that they couldn't bury his grandma. But you can just, they said, you can just say goodbye. Then Bucha happened and all of the atrocities. But this story is very traumatizing for me because it's about how Russia kills people and doesn't give us the possibility to. Um, reach the dead because they it privatizes the voice of the dead and they they speak on behalf of the dead this is why they are crazy about celebrating their victories and they always uh, try to get back to their past and, and talk to their history despite uh, uh, while we would like to listen to people that are still alive and we're collecting evidence from people that are alive that means that we will win in the long term and one more thing that I would like to start with is a story about the fact that I it's very hard for me to analyze what I uh, what I see on the screen because I'm sure that we are on the zero point uh, starting point uh, talking about that because I don't have the right language to talk about that uh, I my terminology my vocabulary doesn't really work here in that situation it I have no words to describe the trauma that we're dealing with and evident and um, apparently if I deal with trauma that means that I can't uh, distance myself with the topic of my speech and it's not quite fair that means I uh, can't be 100% scientific Nevertheless, in 1930, 1931, the head of the Association, American Association of Historians, Carl Becker, uh, wrote a provocative text, a performance, where, we, where he asked a question, every man is his own historian. Like, we are all historians, like, we can be historians, and he Uh, made this analytical operation de describing, defining the history and that he showed no, that's not the case but the history has to be has to get closer to people and I would like to ask you a question can we all be historians and I have the answer yes and no yes, because each one of you every person here in that country and every person outside of that country whoever watches the news about Ukraine you'll have your personal evidence that can be archived or not archived you can just cherish it you can dream about that and we can be affected by them and sometimes it even makes us uh, call out doctors but we can work with that but we have the right to do that and each one of us 
has certain uh, heritage to store photos, videos, screenshots, conversations, messages, and so on and so forth. Every one of us can take active participation in research, including as a narrator and a, that is being interviewed. You can write posts in Facebook because every post, every message, every thought that we express is a source, and I will talk about that later. So each one of us is a bearer of memory or dignity or indignity that we will probably be silent publicly, and this is why I'm critical about oral history because there's a lot that's not being said that's not being said that's not being talked about i haven't seen any uh, texts within a historical research uh, where people would say this is where i did the wrong thing this is where i was a traitor or i i feared and i, w I was scared i couldn't save people so uh, every person builds uh, his own narrative uh, as a story about a nice person in a wider sense. On the other hand, why doesn't every person have the moral right or professional right to be a historian? Because in order to be a historian, you need to have a set of certain uh, skills and competencies. You need to have access to sources, and that's a totally different thing, working with sources. Yes, you have to get closer to what we sometimes we call, I don't like that term, objectivity of a historian. You need to have a bird's eye view uh, over your subject. But you need time and resources, and you need competencies in a wider sense. Uh, nevertheless, when I say that each one of us is a historian, what I mean by that, each one of us a, we live in a history. B, we live by the history because we have a history of our uh, personal relations and love and hate. And C, a country's history. Unfortunately, it comes with a price. So when we say What's the place for us? What's the role for us? The question is actually different. Why do we need the experience of the documentation of the war in the first place? Why? In order to ensure justice, to keep history. Well, how did they document the First World War, Second World War, Arab-Israel conflict, the war in the Balkans, Cambodia, Rwanda? Did it? save the humanity from uh, that uh, terrible behavior, like attacking Russia, attacking Ukraine, genocide. No. This is why, apart from uh, simple things, we need to we need to say we need to record our history. It's like it's like we imagine if you forget your all your personal life <coughs> and before you enter this uh, room and when you enter this room you just don't remember where you came from and this is what Russia did with Ukraine for centuries they built a different history alternative history that would be comfortable for Russia and that would be extremely non comfortable for Ukraine in terms of this victimization so the the, the history is basically is washed out when we talk about the documentation of the war we're talking about uh, setting a setting responsibility and that's quite important and we have individuals and groups and organizations that professionally document the war performing all procedural standards and they know that these documents will be used as evidence in the international court 
Besides, the war should be documented, and it is documented to create narratives. And this is where all hell break loose. It can be propaganda or counter-propaganda. It can be the victimization narrative or past uh, previous speakers talked about the, the grandeur of our history. And, and I'm very afraid of that because any state that uh, focuses uh, on their history, they can turn into a totalitarian state. And history proves it is the case. We should be honest and we should be critical enough, but we need to love ourselves, we need to cherish ourselves, we need to make sure that Ukraine improves. And uh, in order to document uh, the war, you need to uh, be pragmatic, you need to understand how to wage war, and you need to but here there's another problem, the problem of assertiveness, privatizing memory, and therefore we have to speak about different sources of war documentation, about different voices, marginalized and not, the ones who have been deprived of vocalizing themselves and those who are way too vocal at different facilities and platforms, those who try to exercise their authority and power and through different kinds of means they try to privatize the memory of specific heroes, the memory of war and make a certain angel of you of this memory which is also tremendously dangerous and this diverse array of different documents and eyewitness accounts will definitely enable us not to shape a radically different, absolutely heroic public discourse of this war. <clears throat> because victims are way too many. The military that have perished are so many. Along with that, we get to see that nearly every family seeks that Every military who died in this war will be awarded a prize as a hero of Ukraine. But are they truly heroes? For me, they are. But do they have to be awarded the title of the hero of Ukraine? Certainly not, whether we want it or not, because it's a war. It's a, and these are the people who went to defend us. But it doesn't mean that a particular certain group of people can be talked about at all platforms and they can be provided with the title of heroes or victims of the war, whereas the other victims buried in small towns and villages whose mothers and uh, daughters and sisters have no right to articulate their voices, their husbands are no heroes. Is this going to be a true and rightful history, certainly not, which is why so many people on TikTok in particular, and that's something that strikes me, when people film uh, burial stones of their nearest and dearest being buried, and when they talk about them, I understand that this is a way to shout in the face of Ukraine, I am here, I'm also Ukrainian, please get to hear me, because my relative was also a hero. Is this necessary to hear? Is this important? Certainly so. And that means that any platform, I'm not talking about with the methodology. Another thing is how to work with these platforms. But whatever platform and any place or site that can enable us people to articulate our voices, raise our voices, can be processed and can be applied, which is why what documentation is necessary in order to provide this mental help and relief, sort of like providing um, humanitarian efforts jointly in order to rehabilitate the military in post-war time. So when Lindquist in, in the early 1980s in Germany published a manifesto of public historians, young ones at the time, and he said, dig where you're standing. In Germany, there was a whole 
era of local community research of the places under one's feet, what uh, were the people standing on? And today I would like to turn around this linguist's theory and, and say that this is about us. Dig where you're standing, in fact, is shaping and formulating our strategies of war documentation. They are endless and boundless. They're varied. Sometimes they're hard to believe. And I keep collecting TikTok memes uh, posted there by the military. And I believe that this is an extremely important source about this war for me memes. This is a social anthropological mirror of everything happening in this society. It's a response to a specific event taking place here and now or in long term. For me, TikTok is all about uh, stories of specific military personnel sharing what has happened to them. Like yesterday, I saw a military man sharing a story about him urinating and coming back quickly so that a 120 a millimeter uh, dreadful guy would come and scare him. So this is an oral story. This is no oral history in the classical dimension of this word. But it's meaningful. There are different strategies for digging done by us. This is photographing journalism, which I'm going to mention shortly. And this is civil journalism. These are documentaries and organizations advocating human rights or personal human rights projects, archiving, scientific research, military diaries and personally stories and accounts, satellite imagery, art and literature that Mr. Anton Drabovich spoke about. This is also about international organizations, local initiatives. And this is not an exhaustive list, you understand of the places where we can get dig and we're supposed to dig, depending on the task set before us, our willingness or unwillingness to do so. But there's another issue to that. When we talk about testimonies, where the hardest begins, how to interpret these testimonies, what language to use to describe them, how reliable are them, what status as a sword do they enjoy? Whether they have a status of uh, being called a source, is it is just uh, one author to them, or uh, is it collective authorship, or is this just a folk um, tale? So when we talk about the power and the strength of these testimonies. So we are speaking about who and what stands behind them, what underpins them to be institutionalized. For example, oral voices or documentaries. So today, when I see the trend for uh, the cinema starting in 2014 all the way until now, is amplifying its efforts in order to become the main source of uh, witnessing about this war. And this is terribly dangerous because we like myths. They're comfortable to live in. They do not require any analysis. They're not complicated or demanding. They explain the world to us in their own way, like a lot of fiction cinema or documentaries, fact-based uh, documentaries to that. So when I'm talking about the power of this testimony, I'm talking about who is the representative or the archiver of these testimonies. Is this a political force or political forces behind them? Is this a certain separate group of people who for some reason believe that this evidence should be at the top on the surface? We also speak about the power of this, these testimonies, how effective uh, impactful they are on Twitter or TikTok has nothing to do with the uh, legal dimension. But for young people, it matters a lot. And there are tweets that gain uh, dozens of thousands of views. I only have two minutes left, oh dear me. And they gain a lot in popularity and become tremendously popular. So let me just skip a couple of slides. Here I would like to mention about a little bit about gap memorization policy, something that I'm developing. It's a great gap between the institutional memory about this war and as opposed to a variety of grassroots, sporadic, and professional organizations that deal with <coughs> memorization. But on the other hand, when we talk about competitiveness, um,
irreversibility and responsibility of memory. When we talk about in-depth interviews, right now it's expanding its uh, capacity, its opportunities, and it's still in the process of search because digital narrations of history, a certain participatory practices, I would even call them collaborative efforts uh, engaging artists, they are important, but they shift emphasis. There's a fantastic American soci sociologist who said about cousins kissing. So he speaks about very similar processes, but oral history requires a methodology, clarity. It's very complicated. And on the other hand, during COVID, it proved to be inefficient. And I'm not sure that nowadays oral history is more efficient as opposed to short interviews and short narratives provided by the media specialists. I've probably run out of time, but one more statement to make. Collective evidence, our collective efforts when collecting evidence and documenting the events of the war, the manifestations of that in TikTok and YouTube, uh, its forms both printed and non-printed texts and recordings. So this collective agency enables us all to le legitimize and interpret our own history in our own way. And it entitles us to documenting this war and speaking through this grief and shaping this national narrative. And everyone is entitled to that, starting with the youngest blogger somewhere in Pokrovsk, all the way to Granny Ganna in Demida village who would share her own account. And this is important because this war mustn't be appropriated by anyone, no politicians, no political leaders. Unfortunately, this war already belongs to us. And we are to carry this memory together and to become these collective agents in keeping building this nation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you a lot to Anton Legusha for one of the key speeches of today. And we are coming to the second panel of this forum dedicated to the practices and foundations that the environment of the professionals and institutions are working on when documenting war experiences. A lot has been said today about the differences of documenting based on different scientific methodologies and projects of oral history began to be uh, documented in the 1990s and since 2006 we have the association of oral history and now different programs dedicated to oral history public oral history are present in a lot of tertiary high school education institutions and due to the challenges of war that's something that you practitioners and specialists emphasize probably the practice of documentation in Ukraine of war experiences is probably most actively exercised in Ukraine and the huge area of these uh, evidences is being collected here and uh, now the Museum of the Civilian Voices is one of the most conspicuous in the whole area of different uh, pieces of evidence about war within the framework of the panel concerning oral history, the tasks, roles, and issues. The participants will be speaking about bottlenecks, rankling issues in terms of documenting the history, as well as the role of Ukrainian experience for the world, global practices of documentation. Ms. Anton has just shared about some of the uh, recent experiences of documenting war in the years preceding this war, and we were able to see that not all of these methods are functional or efficient under different circumstances of war. So Yulia Manukian is to um, mo monitor. She comes from Kherson, and she is um, the Vaclav Gavel winner. So you're invited to be on the stage, and 
The mic is in your hands. Thank you. Now I'm inviting our distinguished speakers, Natalia Yemchenko, Irena Lopatina, Katya Taylor, and Andrei Dubchuk. A small bridge to make before we launch into our discussion about other initiatives which are not to do with institutions or some academic studies. And I would like to make this bridge between the first panel and our panel discussions. Because we talked here about not only the re-traumatizing narrators, but also burning out of those people who are affected by uh, the narratives of the survivors when they collect these stories, when they do interviews. So this is something that goes without saying, right? But somehow we have to refer to it because the people who began this process a long time ago, back in 2014, have their say in this. And my f first question goes to Janine. Di Giovanni, an American journalist who has been working for more than 35 years highlighting armed conflicts and genocide. So when she was doing an interview to the Suspirne television, she said that in her recording project, there is a special methodology that provides not only for practices of avoiding re-traumatizing history carriers, but also special practices that uh, help journalists, volunteers, and activists not to burn out. So they're traumatizing, and recipes for them to avoid that are no less important. Therefore, I wanted to ask her to, ask her to share a, li a little bit about that, because each one of us present here, it seems to me, is going through this stage. So this is the first inspiration, the first in enthusiasm is drying out. We are fatigued. This horror and pain that we are recording, unfortunately, is doing not very pleasant things to us. So she's online with us. So I would like you to speak about what are we to do with our journalists, activists, and volunteers who feel that they are burning out, that they get traumatized when working with other people's pain? What are we to do to the people that are helping us to document other people's pain? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear all right. Okay, great. So uh, my name is Janine Di Giovanni. I am the executive director of the Reckoning Project. We are a small war crimes unit inside Ukraine. Um, before I talk about trauma, because I am not a psychologist, so I don't feel equipped to speak on behalf of every everyone's trauma, but I will speak generally about interviewing techniques that could protect both the people that you speak to while you're taking testimonies and also protecting yourself. Um, a bit of background about the Reckoning Project. I'm not a historian. For 35 years, um, beginning actually in the Gaza Strip. And as I watch the terrible siege of the Gaza Strip happening right now, my heart is breaking. It's breaking for everyone that was killed, the people that were killed by Hamas, but collective punishment against uh, many people who are innocent inside Gaza is a terrible thing. But what I was also thinking is people are recording this, and this is the genesis of oral history. Um, people will be taking notes. Now we have cell phones where people can film. Um, there are uh, multiple ways in which we can record testimonies. Um, what the Reckoning Project does is very different, though, than just taking testimonies. We want our... So our journalists, um, who are all Ukrainian, are trained to a very high level in several things, in international humanitarian law, in trauma, 
so as not to traumatize the person they are speaking to and also to protect themselves. And we use a specific methodology that we have developed um, over the 18 months that we've been working um, that we then verify and then we help prosecutors internationally and in Ukraine um, seek justice. The second part of what we do with the Reckoning Project is we use our testimonies to build multimedia platforms. And this is so that the truth is never distorted and that the truth remains intact so that the narrative, the facts, could be played out in journalism through essays, um, through films, through plays. Um, cultural memory, historical memory is very important. I want to get back to another war that I reported, which uh, really led me and inspired me to create the Reckoning Project with Peter Pomerantsev and Natalia Gumenyuk. Um, and that was the siege of Sarajevo. So going back to 1992, um, there was a three year siege, a medieval siege of a city in Europe. There was no water, there was no electricity, there was no heating, but more importantly, there was no internet in those days. Um, maybe there was for people working in Washington or some faraway places, but in Sarajevo, it was there was no internet and there was no electricity. So how did we record what was happening so that it could be used forever? Um, there were no cell phones either. I mean, this is long before any kind of technology began. What I did as a reporter was every morning I went to the morgue. At the morgue, the dead soldiers were brought in the night before and the civilians who had been killed in street fighting or in battles or in um, when I say street fighting, I mean uh, shells landing or some kind of rocket attack. Um, or some people died of the cold or of malnutrition. And the man who ran the morgue was the most reliable historian for me, even though he was an ordinary guy who worked for the city of Sarajevo. But we would sit together every morning and we would go through the names, the ages, the dates, how these people died. Um, he actually kept something which he called the Book of the Dead. And it was a record of the three and a half years of the terrible siege of Sarajevo. Elsewhere, there were historians who were writing down how many shells fell a day, because sometimes 300, 400, sometimes thousands of shells fell. How much food got into the city, um, how people were living their day-to-day -day existence, their life under wartime. This, to me, was absolutely the most important thing to record. How did people survive? How did they continue to educate their families, raise their children, open wartime schools, make bread out of rice? How did they celebrate their holidays, their Byram, their Christmas, their Easter, their Ramadan? Um, how did they continue their family life, which, of course, um, during all wartime, including Ukraine, the main, the main project of the occupier and the aggressor is to destroy society. How do they destroy society? By destroying the family. So I want to go from Sarajevo to a more modern war, which you, as Ukrainians, will be able to identify very much. It's Syria. Why is Syria important for you? Because it was another Putin war, and it was a war that he entered in 2015 with the intent of destroying the people's morale and destroying a people. But more importantly, and the point for this forum on oral history, is that by 2015, when Putin entered the war and began to destroy cities like Aleppo, everyone had a cell phone. So people went out on the streets and began taking photographs of the barrel bombs, of the rockets, of the aftermath of the attacks. They would interview their own families. They would get and keep an, a, a record of what was happening. 
Now, it, this was all extraordinary. It was the most documented war in history. But what happened is it was not verified at the time. And much of that, all of those documents, or most of it, as well as paper documents, were sent outside of Syria by very brave human rights activists. And they are stored in a place in Geneva on the grounds of the United Nations called the Triple IM, which is a mechanism trying to go through and validate and use these videos and these documents in courts of law to help build war crime tribunals. What we did differently in Syria, what the Reckoning Project and many of my colleagues um, in the various coalitions, the accountability space, what we are trying to do is to not have this enormous backlog of videos or of documents. So we are working in real time when the atrocities happen we are there. We are taking the testimonies very carefully, using very carefully prepared templates that we have worked on with lawyers, uh, with other human rights activists, draw, and I, which I've worked on drawing from my experience doing this before in other countries like Yemen, Syria, Iraq. We get the testimonies, we, va we verify them, we then archive them. We have our own archive, but we're beginning to look into ways of sharing our work with other groups that do this work. And then we use them. But we're trying to control the input, which is really important, because otherwise we will be overwhelmed, the prosecutors will be overwhelmed, and the historians will be overwhelmed in time to come. So I just want to end this, dear colleagues, to say, um, I applaud your incredible courage. Um, the Ukrainian people are amongst the strongest and bravest and most extraordinary heroes I've ever seen. Um, nothing will break you, and that really has a huge impression on me every time I come to your beautiful country, how, how people refuse to capitulate. Um, getting back to your original question about trauma, Resilience is a very um, interesting word and an interesting concept. Um, I have been part of many studies on trauma, on post-traumatic stress disorder and the effect of it on war reporters and also on researchers, on cameramen, on photojournalists, on first responders. Um, Many psychiatrists have studied it for a long time. They're not exactly sure why some, why some people are more protected from it than others. They believe that people who are on the front line witnessing it over and over again, the images that are, um, that are stored in their memory, that for some people, resilience will kick in and they will be able to overcome this nightmare of trauma. For others, it is very raw, it's very profound, it's very painful. Um, I tell my team all the time the importance of um, downloading that information psychologically. So, of course, they are doing it while they take testimonies, but it's very important privately to record your own um, emotions, keeping journals, this is very important. Having therapy, if it's available to you, if it's not, finding a resource. Um, there are many, many avenues to go to. If anyone is wants information on this, you're welcome to come to me and I can share resources such as the DART Center for Trauma uh, at Columbia University in America, who are excellent. They have a website, the DART Center for Trauma. You can visit it, you can, it's in Ukrainian, I believe. You can see resources that you yourself can use and also to make sure you are not traumatizing the people you are interviewing. Now, if I wanted to give a class on not traumatizing witnesses, it would take me um, a long time. But basically, um, I would say a few things generally. Um, be very careful if people are traumatized. In fact, those traumatized people, usually their testimonies cannot be admitted to court. So you may have to come back several times
when the person you want to talk to, the survivor or the victim, is calmer, um, make sure they are in a safe place. Never try to interview them at the scene of an attack or a bombing. Um, I know that's what journalists do, but if you are a researcher, if you're trying to go deeper, if you're a historian, you know very well to try to take them to some a place that is safe and where they feel safe. Sometimes they want to bring a family member, especially if it is in regard to sexual violence. Um, be extremely careful. Um, second, children. And I say this because the Reckoning Project is about to embark on a year-long project um, um, gathering testimonies of the stolen Ukrainian children and the caretakers and the parents who, um, who are surrounding them. Um, you really should be working with psychologists when you work with children or someone, a social worker who is with them. At any rate, that is a whole other session. Um, I urge you, all of you dear colleagues, to refer to the DART Center, which has many guidelines for working on this. As for yourselves, I wish you all the strength in the world. My heart is with you. I just returned from Ukraine, training a new group of, of Ukrainian researchers. Um, I try to come as often as I can. And when I'm not there, I am, I feel like I am still there. Um, Please be careful, be safe, take care of yourselves physically, but also emotionally. It is so important what you are recording right now gets saved forever. And in order for you to keep a fair record, a just record, and a historical record, you have to be healthy. Thank you, and Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava. Thank you very much. You know, I have a possibility to present our speakers for the panel. Natalia Yevchenko, I represented her. Andriy Dubchap, a photographer, war correspondent. Uh, he has lots of rewards. Uh, finalist of uh, Georgi Gongadze's reward. He has a medal for the assistance to armed forces of Ukraine. He's a co-founder of a Donbass frontliner independent media, Irina. Irina Lapatina, reporter, author of The Reckoning Project. She will be with us today. And Janine, we letting her go. And Katya Taylor, She's a head of different night projects. Uh, she's a founder of Port Agency, author of a book, Management and Culture Marketing. Before we get back to this issue, like, uh, what's your perspective on uh, dealing with this horrific experience? I would like to give you a short uh, example. When I was under occupation in Kherson, they uh, offered me a translation job uh, an accounting for uh, witness account of witnesses, a description of uh, tortures and uh, abuse that they survived, and it broke me down. I, I kept on crying, and I think I will never forget a detail. And I understand very well that. I'm not a person that will work in that area. When I was interviewed, I was re-traumatized all the time. And it's about interview ethics in re-traumatization. I think it relates to the the problem of uh, uh, traumatizing of the interviewer. How do you uh, find yourself in that situation? So what, do you have any re-traumatization experience, a personal experience? Um, a burnout experience and exhaustion when you work with that. Yes, you dealt with that quite a lot of time in uh, your online museum, the Civilian Voices Museum. I guess your uh, team has some methodology how to counter that burnout. 
as I already mentioned, we started writing testimonials without understanding what kind of evidence is that in 2015 as part of our humanitarian mission. How it happened, our mobile teams went on the ground and we mostly worked in the gray zone in the zones where we have problems with uh, our coverage, informing, basic things. And people felt that they were abandoned and they were lonely. And very quickly we realized that, that the ability to talk about that is more precious than even getting the food that we brought them. It's not just about giving them stuff, goods, and leaving. They wanted to talk. And uh, at a point, we uh, built the process in such a way that the volunteers could allocate some time, at least um, for 20% like, of the people they wanted to talk. In 2015, based on that experience, we've uh, created a first project, a unique project in Ukraine. We gathered a group of experts, psychologists, different people from different countries of the world. We had Glusman, we had uh, psychologists who worked with Bislan uh, victims. In th That's what happened in 2015. And we created a protocol in Ukraine, the first protocol to work with war traumas. We created this protocol and we have uh, trained the first 200 psychologists because the ordinary psychologists can't work with traumas. And that's very unique. Uh, expertise and we've uh, created that protocol and we sent it to the Ministry of Social Policy so everything that happens in Ukraine and in Ukraine we have lots of experience we have lots of psychologists that work with military with children we have lots of experience and it started with what we've built we did that uh, consciously uh, consciously and we it, it's what called supervision because the burnout was extraordinary. People um, were soaked with this pain. And um, people, these people were in a state of permanent trauma in 2016. That training, that supervision became a huge part of our work because mostly journalists work with us. Then we have realized, and it was a great experience for, for us and a great competency. We realized that the preparation for the interview, the creation of the safe space, it uh, takes uh, 30 or 40 percent of the time. We just structured that. So if we mostly described things, we realized that we need to prepare, get prepared for that. And we didn't do anything. We didn't write anything when people were in that altered state where they didn't do that. So first we, we did that and we just took a look at the results and we realized that we can't use the results. So there was a huge responsibility and we had all of the permits. You can imagine we got lots of legal permits. We like we always need to sign the, the, the personal data agreement and uh, we have a structured history but if we have even if we have permits we still need to uh, make a judgment like we need to decide whether we're working with that or not so we had time since 2015 to 2022 we took our time we had 20,000 stories that we collected, yet we've worked uh, every day to make sure that it's, you know, not the common state. We had time to prepare, and we've mostly worked with stories that already happened, that were already over, because there was, these were people from Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast, and it was over for them. It wasn't over uh, legally and in terms of the government, dealing with government, but uh, it was over in terms of war for them. When we have a great expanded program to rehabilitate children, this girl, Milana from Mariupol, she was wounded in 2015. She lost her mother and she lost her leg. So we 
and we worked with her for six years because uh, we need to find prosthetics and uh, we create a mural in Mariupol when the Russians destroyed Mariupol they they destroyed the mural and this is how they destroyed the memory the last that I want to say and I think that's quite important the greatest challenge for us we I mean we do understand that interviewers uh, need to be engaged in supervision they need to be supervised and they they because they are traumatized it's there and um, we collect that information we publish it in a certain amount of time there is a certain lack between the uh, interview and a publication we have a pu publishing team and they are less lot less traumatized we have Olya Cook who's a editor-in-chief and she worked as a Sivodnia, um or today newspaper editor-in-chief and she doesn't do interviews and that's another filter she l takes a look at the history and she says something's wrong with that and I have questions about this and about that and that's uh, so like a second line of verifying. Concerning trauma, two important remarks to make. Concerning collection of stories. And the first uh, major challenge that we have to deal with, of course, there's always a conflict between the methodological correctness and property, quality and quantity. This balance can be struck only in collaboration of um, practitioners and theorists theorists and the people who work on the methodology uh, for the work in the fields. We are very productive in our cooperation with the Lublin University. Together with them, very slowly, very uh, it's a very hard process, but we are setting up this guide. I was just about to ask you about this guide. Yes, yeah, this is all in process. It's a work in progress. It's so hard. I think it's one of the hardest projects that we've ever dealt with because there are people who are experts at methodologies and there are our practitioners and our task is to create this kind of diffusion a very cautious one but so far the penetration is so difficult where's the snag well the issue is that we as practitioners we understand all of the restrictions but they as theoreticians understand the uh, golden standard yes we have heard about it today and the reality doesn't match well with uh, the theory. What's important about it, this guide? Right now, everyone seems to be collecting and gathering, but just passing on the baseline knowledge, especially for the people who are not the experts at that, this matters a lot. Because unless there is no methodology, huge sets of information are backlogged and they cannot be matched with anything. This is a lost resource, my first point, first statement is about this conflict and we are, as a big institution are doing everything we can to make a certain contribution to establishing or creating a more or less consolidated field. The second is our capability. This is a huge problem at stake. Why? because everyone is collecting because they are so enthusiastic. A great number of initiatives uh, stemmed from personal experiences and now not, in order not to waste it, something has to come up where we can forward all of this or a place where we can come and say, I've done it. I can no longer keep carrying this, keep bearing this brand. Please help me or give me some advice or tips. So the sector is oversaturated. On the other hand, it's also losing its capacity. So the challenge is that along with losing one's motivation and capacity, you see people are unfortunately getting too weak. We mustn't waste the potential that is still there. Thank you. And the same question goes to Andri. Just yesterday, I read your latest interview where you very specifically spoke about this problem of exhaustion, fatigue, both your own and the people that you're working with. You know, we'll be speaking more as a practitioner. As of now, we are faced with this huge problem of burnout, post-traumatic or real-time uh, traumatic disorder, 
stress dis disorder the journalists are suffering from and a great number of international journalist teams unfortunately their number is shrinking and Ukrainian reporters have to communicate a lot more to the world concerning the things happening in the world because you know that the intensity of hostilities is probably much more intense it's higher than it was at the beginning of the in intrusion and the number of shells uh, during a unit of time is much higher than before. Burnout, yes, it's there. Post-traumatic syndrome is there. Personal distortion, uh, professional distortion is still there because once again, if I see dead bodies, somehow it doesn't concern me much. I film that completely unperturbably, no emotions disturb me. If people are living or traumatized or injured, the situation is more complicated. So here I can give a very simple tip to all of the journalists working with that. Do not hide, don't conceal your emotions. If you feel you want to cry, cry and weep and shed tears or yell, because uh, this is the uh, way to give vent to all of this accumulation, accumulated stress, and thus you will be diminishing this stress disorder. You also require some recuperation, but it feels like sometimes you keep running and running, then you go for a recreation or to take a break, and suddenly all of this wave of terrible emotion, it just comes up, c catches up with you, and you seem to dive into a the chasm, and then you will have to go and reach out to professional psychologists who know how to work with PTSD and who know how to handle it. But my advice to you is, of course, take breaks. The stress has to be there. It's a must. I understand it's a personal question, but have you seen a psychologist? No, I'm just about to start doing that because right now we have some people helping us with this relief and all of the uh, team members from bus frontliners will have to go through this course with psychologists. I have decided it for myself that I have to do it in order to be more efficient in the future. So it's the first time in all of this period that you have been recording war. Yes, it is. Although there were some points that were highly traumatizing when a family died in Irpin on the 6th of March on the bridge. And then there were some more uh, risky moments, uh, things f uh, that endangered my life, and uh, hundreds of kilometers when we had to ride and drive. And uh, But I have to keep working and concerning recording and documenting, a small remark to make. All of the reporters, we work based on standards. We document and record the way that we see it. And on the 28th and 29th, of October, we will join a pr practical training run by the Ukrainian Legal Advisory Group, supported by witnesses. They are training policemen, criminalists, and in fact, they will make and run this practical training session in a former torture chamber on recording crimes, war crimes, not just for social media and recording that for the sake of history, but so that we, after we go through this algorithm, the things that you will record will be admissible in the international courts of law, and this will be taken as evidence of war crimes. Thank you. Irina, do you have this first-hand experience? Let me introduce a small, a small correction. I'm not an author, I'm a documenter. But that's okay. Basically, what I want to say is uh, that my project, when Mr. Dobovich was speaking, he spoke about different forms of how experiences can transform our project. Within the framework of this project, we are trying to crossbreed two experiences, journalism uh, with legal experience. It has both pros and cons. I've been dealing with journalism for nearly 20 years. One of my favorite topics to cover is complicated social topics, diverse, a great field. 
Then, when I was invited to work as a document, uh, document gatherer, working with people who may have been witnesses and survivors of war crimes, I said, OK, I have been doing this all my life, no problem. Yet, the arrogance of mine took a toll on me. First of all, let me say that basically this project is both legal and journalistic, and we were immediately taught a lot about legal aspects, how to work properly, how to document. We have a long questionnaire uh, with a great number of different questions to answer. And we need to do interviews in a way that if there are any trials in the future, this evidence shouldn't be disqualified as testimonies. Because as journalists, perhaps some of you are journalists in uh, this room, and I used to do the same. We can sometimes drive people, uh, lead people to certain kinds of answers. But this is a no-no. It's a red flag and red line. This must never be uh, admitted because uh, it's followed by disqualification. And that means that you have wasted your time, effort, and brought that individual back in that dreadful time frame. And of course, all of these kinds of documentation will never be of legal effect. So we have to be very careful about how we frame our questions. Because quite often we can say, tell us how it happened without anything to lead people to. Once again, if we get back to my experience, Janine basically said, I felt like it was a click with me because she said, consider how many stories you can process. Uh, mentally, just like Ms. Natalia said it. I also tried to record a lot of uh, eyewitness accounts right from the beginning. Uh, we had regional division within the framework of our project. And in every region, we had the people working who came from that region, who knew the people, the, uh, the locations, etc. I come from Irpin. I mean, I had lived 10 years in Irpin before the full-scale invasion. Therefore, Kiev region was my realm. Later on, there were also accounts from other regions. Access from Kiev to Kiev region is very plain and simple, so I began to drive around and collect these testimonials. And let me also clarify that maybe this is not the proper way to say it. We select people for documentation who were direct eyewitnesses. That is to say they, they must have seen or heard uh, so this is like from horse's mouth. You know, sometimes people say, Daddy Peter, Uncle Peter has told me, but I say, I'm sorry, I have to talk directly to this Uncle Peter. So this workload is a lot. It's a very difficult thing to persuade an eyewitness to speak. It also requires a lot of energy. I know it from my personal experience. Why talk about that? Why would this eyewitness need it? Why would these people have to delve back in these experiences that they would like to leave in oblivion? So once again, talking about me, I was so enthusiastic at the beginning. I began to, uh, to talk to a lot of eyewitnesses right, recording all of them, executions, deportations, captivities, although within the framework of our project, we can record several eyewitness accounts per month. People knew that there was a certain boundary, and they told me about that, but nobody is stopping you. So you are your own stopper. 
and in three months of this work, I started feeling that there had been way too many people, way too many stories, and I had my own personal tragedy with reference to Erpin, etc. Probably in the month of August, I remember it so distinctly. I was in Riga, Latvia, and we were documenting. I was documenting the Mezhovi's uh, family story. It was one of the stories about children's deportation to the Russian Federation. And there in Riga, there were eyewitnesses, our Ukrainian witnesses, a family from Mariupol who had been trying to go through the Green Corridor, and they were shelled and shot. And the parents, unfortunately, have to live with, indi uh, with disability as a result of that, and their children died. When I was on, uh, talking by phone uh, to the father in this family, he said no to me because he said he had given all of the um, evidence to the Latvian prosecutorial office. I could have just put down the phone and said, OK, but we kept talking. And he somehow told me a bit about this experience, what exactly had happened to him and his family. And when he was telling me that they didn't know still that their child had died, sorry to say, he said to me that he saw a video shot by the propagandists, uh, this colon, column of people that had been shot through, and there in the car they saw their child. And from that video they came to know about the fact that their child had been killed. And he was telling me this video about watching that video, seeing the locks of the hair of his child waving in the air. And at this point, he burst out crying. Uh, on the one end of this conversation, on the other end of the conversation, I was all in tears. We finished this conversation. I went back to Ukraine. And after that, you know, it was the final drop the final straw. Then during several weeks, I had these flashbacks coming to me all the time, this picture, because I hadn't seen this video with the uh, child's hair waving in the air. One of the tips was given to us. Never imagine the imagery that you heard about. Don't try to visualize or imagine that. Do not allow this thing to happen in that in your imagination unfortunately i had allowed that to happen and for several weeks i kept having these flashbacks of the child's locks but how can you put a stop to that how can you bar it from happening the first ad advice is what Jenin said you have to take care of yourselves you mustn't be over enthusiastic you un must understand how many of such stories you can digest and second tip based on my personal story is psychology. In our, within our project, we have psychotherapists and psychologists. I immediately warned my editor that I was having problems. And I had to go through a long therapy with this therapist. I cannot say that I am a hundred percent all right. Even if you go through such training sessions a hundred times, even if you hear multitude of times someone else's experience, you will think that you will be secured. You will never be secured because you have your own background, your own story, your personal traumas, and they can overlap each other. Therefore, you have to be extra cautious about your own emotions. You have to stop timely. You have to be honest to yourself. Yes. Maybe your motives are very good and proper that we have to document and record as many stories as possible, which is true. This is the quantity, yeah? but still ma time matters. Time is a major factor. We have some situations when eyewitnesses died as a result of uh, heart attacks, but the only thing that we were able to do is to film and record the whole story narrated by that eyewitness. Therefore, it will allow us later on to articulate this eyewitness's account. And it's not going to be just to go down in history or go down into oblivion. 
may be part of a trial. So there's a kind of a con conflict, a contradiction. You have to be in a hurry and stop in time because all of this keeps hovering above you. Yeah, you're always on this rickety bridge, so to say, swaying uh, to and fro, or perhaps delegate this to someone else if you cannot deal with this yourself in order not to lose the story. Yeah, I understand what you mean. I can honestly tell you that these topics, and even within our project, we had some researchers saying that social violence is something I'm, I am not working with. And we said, OK, so you are not working with that. Thank you very much. Then Katya, please. I very much like it that we are being so subjective right now. We can afford it. We can afford to speak about ourselves right now to a certain degree. So what's your question? I mean, you have been confronted with your personal burnout when you were working with a great number of art exhibitions about the war or when you were in interaction with artists who also burn out and they're already exhausted when working with this particular topic. So how somehow you're also engaged in that. So what is your personal ex experience and background in this field? Um. Yeah, thanks. Just wanted to say a few words about the role of art in this war. Yeah, that's going to be the next question. Okay. Okay, because it's a broad question. I'm just getting there. Okay, I will just speak for myself. The way I feel when I talk to my colleagues, I think we're all in the permanent state of burnout. It's not that you can really uh, stop it and you can work with psychologists. I think that's the kind of a turbulence that we have inside. And it stays with us. Maybe if not forever, it, it's there for, for a while until the that confusing state is over. So this confusing and and exhaustion is there. So while I'm running, while I'm doing something important, and this thing that I'm doing is larger than me, I'm OK with that. And as soon as I stop, it hits me. And it's very hard to deal with that. And I think art really helps with that. It has lots of roles nowadays. And it, there were lots of stereotypes about that. It's people think that it's just, uh, you know, contemplating the beautiful. But it, but but since it's just a representation of the, it's not a, represent, a representation of the beautiful because the reality is not beautiful right now. It represents the uh, reality really, and it has lots of different roles like cultural diplomacy. And uh, there's, there's certain art therapy because it should help a lot. And what it does, that's a separate practice. It's not an official therapy. But in order to be an art therapist, you have to study. You have to uh, get a diploma. And um, just, just a bad reputation in the society because People think that art therapy is about may painting a picture, but it also deals with different body practices, uh, working with communities. Artists are people that can help you get engaged it's, and understand that you don't just have a body, you have your head your mind and the, the art also has a role to document things Mo mostly dealt with reflection now it's different I, I will just say that working in that area yeah I will I'm really interested in the therapeutic effect we are trying to measure that it's impossible to measure that because uh, these are individual practices 
but me and my team we did a couple of events where we had many people and we had conversations because conversations matter but it's not enough because the pain and the, the discomfort and the concern it will we feel it through our body and there are lots of ways to to work with that but that's not like repairing things it's not like you you do a repass and then you can function normally for a while these practices like art practices different therapeutic practices they need to be integrated in our life on a day-to-day -day basis when you wake up in the morning you do your exercises you uh, have a breakfast and you do something for yourself and it helps me personally a lot because I do simple things like meditation but the d discipline is more important than motivation because nobody can help you more than than you can because you know how you know how you can do that and for some reason maybe because in my environment the people are like a very tolerant very calm and it's like a bubble but it's the case and when I stay within that bubble, I can bring down the stress. And especially now, we have different art practices and they become a very important part of our everyday life. And it's uh, some sort of a self-therapy. And the art is not separated from us. It's not just something that exists only in museums. It can be integrated into our life. It's, of course, it's not the ultimate answer, but it can affect our inner state. And it help us cope with everything that we deal uh, around. And this is where we come to this art documentation. Thank you very mu much for, for, for the things you've said. And I've read today, and you talked about that. You talked about museum practices. And there's a trend in the Western country that we are broadcasting political narratives through these small personal stories. And I think I will just bring you, Andre and Katia, together just by giving an example. Back in 2021, Melitopol uh, authorities announced a competition for Holodomor Victim Memorial, and they uh, invited modern artists, and uh, they selected five projects, and they were based on the creation of uh, this calm public space with a commemorative uh, component, not just like a this necropolis-style memorial, but something modern, and this commemorative part. Uh, will be very easy where people would could be uh, submerged could be immersed in that history and it can happen voluntarily and um, Mr. Valashuk and Himane project they basically entered a local a natural museum and they saw a photograph of a family or a Kirichenko family if I'm not mistaken and there's a mother three children and there's a coffin and a four-year boy named Mikola lying in the coffin and they made that photograph uh, on their way from the graveyard for their father who worked at the, the cello construction project and they, they we, we, we don't know who the author is but you can basically tell a story just by looking at a photograph uh, in uh, for Holodomor, they chose that photograph for their project for this public space, a small Stella, and uh, this this photograph embodied into that uh, Stella. It's not in the center of the public space; it's a bit on the on the, on, on the outskirts, on, on the side. And people believed that this small bit in this uh, huge uh, sea of uh, disaster, Holodomor will, will influence people more than 
something big. So can an art be a method to document something? Can it photograph uh, a, like a fictional document? Can, can it be a document? And can a documentary uh, photograph can be a piece of art? And as a person that org organized residency and occupation in Kherson, uh, I had this job to do. What we are going to do is to document the atrocities, the, the reality and the occupation. Well, they, however, they, of course, these artists, they responded to what happened in the country. And thanks to Helena, because she helped us distinguish between these different types of responses and critical thinking. So I think art is, is a document for me, even the documentation method. And I think Katya will say it better than everyone. I can see, I can say three things. As far as commemoration is concerned, I'm sure that strongest commemoration projects are projects are, that are integrated into public space. The reason why I think that uh, large memorials, personally, I think it's doctrine related things. These are locations that are responsible for doctrine, for the official narrative of the state. And Olia said, uh, well, there should be a message from the from the authorities, from the state. There should be an archive, centralized archive. And what do you think about that? I think one of the best commemoration practices are the cornerstones. And it's a German project. I think it's four years old. It's uh, absolutely an art project that was done by an artist. And it's cornerstones, or stumbling stones, sorry. Uh, a uh, commemoration practice for Holocaust victims. And the stones are there because in Judaism, burial ceremony used stones. Um, and they don't use graves. And stumbling stones, uh, they, they call that because they are located within streets in the city. You can find these uh, stumbling stones among cobblestones. And there's a small writing there saying this man or woman buried there. This is where this person worked. And it it's well integrated in the cityscape. And I think it really works with the with the uh, with the never again concept. And that there was a great project called the Last Address for Stalin's repression victims. They had lots of uh, these uh, signs, and they, they they've been actively uh, removing them nowadays. And it's an example how art can be integrated into everyday life and. I think it bears this commemoration practice to every person, to every bystander, every pedestrian. You don't have to go somewhere to experience that. And the second story, what Katya uh, does with the partners, uh, these are logbooks, uh, diaries. Uh, war is a very physical experience. You can't just retell it. And uh, I experienced the war back in 2014. And this is why I, when I came to Kiev, I started, I, I tried to talk about that. Was it efficient? No, it wasn't. Because it was far away. It wasn't evident for many people. So it's very physical. You remember that everything changed for Ukraine when leaders of three European countries came to Bucha and changed everything because that was a physical experience, not just a uh, experience of the war. It's just a, just a touch, small touch. So I think diaries is one of the few tools that uh, 
can be used by documentation and they should be rethought in a not sense and they have and give you that possibility to have that little touch and again I'm not an art person I'm a manager yeah that's why it's interesting to listen to you and I guess um, yeah, I mean we're on the same page with Katia and the war showed us how art not just culture but specifically art became um, a strong voice a strong way to talk about our experience the language of art this is why it's uh, valuable for us managers because this is universal language we don't have universal tools it's very hard for us to explain ourselves and this is why art is a universal language it's very complicated for us to um, conceive uh, art projects because we can't structure them Yes, and the criticism uh, about subjecti subjectivity, the question, why can we really rely on a piece of art as a, as a document because it's just a subjective compilation of fact with different emphasis? And I keep asking that question nowadays. So this is why it's interesting. That's right. That's right. Well, I, can't, I, I have all of the tools like a photo and videos and text but I think photography is uh, the most universal language to uh, transfer information especially if we are reaching the foreign audience and uh, the people have very small amount of time to uh, digest that information so this is why we have photograph and it says it all it it's not a problem what race or gender you are you understand what's going on there people are crying people are laughing it tells a story and this is why this real-time experience is important and this photography our sources is a part of archive it can be archived and uh, it's a cultural value I'll just add that you had a couple of exhibitions and uh, do you think they are mostly journalist exhibitions or it's a, or there is an art component of course there's an art component in it absolutely even the way some media present it it's has an art component just remember the hands of dyed women with polished nails the the photo the photograph of the, these fingers nails and it's it, it's it's a i i believe i don't believe question you look at it and you either relate or don't relate you just make a conclusion emotionally and mentally this is why photography today is one of the great ways to communicate information about Ukraine of course uh, speaking about personal stories they are always more powerful because people uh, compare themselves with these stories and it's better for, 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 for people to relate to that rather than just uh, having a a panoramic view from a drone yes it's about interpretation yes people are more engaged this is why yes it's not um, it's not a testimony for, for, for courts but it's more efficient nowadays so we need to separate photographs that can be attached to a case and in form of art it's mostly form of art because to document you just need to choose the right angle you need to find the right object a dead body or a shell a piece of shell that's a different approach right here uh, just a short remark and then we will listen to Katerina as a professional um, I'd like to say right away that we started a cooperation with London Document uh, Documentary Theatre in summer 
and we send them the part of the story, some of public stories because we have private stories that are not published anywhere. We don't create any media materials for them or newspaper stories. It's uh, mostly done to protect the witnesses and survivors because sometimes their family members are under occupation and sometimes the witnesses themselves are under occupation. This is why right, some of the archive uh, records are not public and they will never be public. So the London Theatre selected up to 10 stories and based on these stories they will be writing um, a a stage play script they will create characters based on on that stories and they will run it in different theaters all over the world telling about what happened here and one of the st some of these stories I mean some of the stories were stories told by the witnesses I talked to and I told them this is how they will use your story. Do you agree with that? Because as Natalia said, we have many documents that witnesses have to sign right before the interview. And well, like we have their agreements with their signatures, but ethically we need to ask them a question. So when I was personally in communication with them, telling them that this was an option available, Two out of three eyewitnesses said, yes, okay. One of the women who had lost a child said that she was even ready to speak to the dramatist himself to share more details. Another, the elder man of the church, uh, of the uh, village said, I would like to see this stage performance in Ukraine. And I said myself, yes, I want it too. When talking to the third eyewitness, we're still in negotiations with that. I have to be frank with you because the people who have survived such events, similar events, are very badly traumatized. And more often than not, basic trust in the world is already violated in them. And although we are in communication, still there are a lot of cautions and caveats, and these people are afraid to step over some things. So we are talking to them, trying to change this person's um, ideas, but still, this is work in progress. Thank you very much, because documentary theater, eyewitness theater, is a, of great interest for me. And I know that the people who have sometimes gone through some tragic or very dramatic events agree to take part in the verbatims of such uh, documentary performances. In a way, this also becomes a therapy, a therapy for them because they get it off their chest. And in a way, this becomes a kind of a performance practice for them, and they get rid of a particular part of their trauma. These are extremely meaningful things, and I'm so happy that you have articulated, vocalized all of these things, because I didn't even know that you had this project. Yes, we have just selected the stories, and now the beginning of uh, the writing process is just commencing. And one more thing to add. The re basic requirement of the people that we are in communication with right now uh, the core story that will become the base storyline. This is a man who says, Irina, I want it to be, I want you to show everything exactly as it was. All of the details, all of the words, all of the events. I want it all to be reflected 100% accurately. However, you know, art, although this is the documentary theater, there may be some changes or alterations because there may be more than 10 stories from different regions. So right now we are in communication with this man, once again to say that his story is the documented truth. But maybe some minuscule things are going to be changed and modified. So there may be some elements of fiction, do you mean, or because it depends on the compilation, because when you have a particular editing 
um, added to the bottom. It immediately adds this fiction element. But these people have to understand that this is not something that is going to be an eyewitness account uh, spoken in the theater. Yep. It's very difficult to communicate it. There are dramatists, stage producers who work with these testimonials. So there is a fear that the end product will be perceived not in the way that this man is imagining that. So this is what I'm afraid of most because I'm in communication with this man. And honestly, I'm afraid exactly of that. You can show him some of the videos of the, the well-documented performances like that and stage productions. I think that you can get it across to him. Thank you. At last. Katya, now you have the mic in your hands. All what you want to say, get it off your chest because you can make a statement or debunk all of those, refute all of those doubts concerning documentation and the way it is reflected in art. Art documentation as equally important and meaningful in terms of reflecting of what's happening to us. You know, I've, uh, in my days I was recording different ideas in a way that they can play in what we are speaking about. The first thing that I get to think about when we sp speak about documenting uh, things with photographic and video imagery, I get to think about Zuna, Susan Zontek's work, which is called We Are Looking at Other People's Suffering, or at Other Suffering. This is an abstract title, however, it's a book title. And like in many works written by her, it goes about photography, documentary photography in the first place, and about what documentation is all about. There are a lot of very fine thoughts conveyed, one of which is that there is nothing new about war. Therefore, it's very hard to surprise the world with any of our narratives. No matter how we shout or yell about war, we know that people get tired very quickly, but even before they get tired and weary, they have seen and knew all about war. Because war is a normal state of human existence, whereas peace is something new and novel, something that we have been experiencing for a long period of time up to the end of the Second World War. So this period the, after the Second World War once again, on the one hand, there was nothing new, but it was heavily dependent on technological developments. However, there was no social contract to condition the development of the society. Civilians documented it all in different ways. Perhaps after the Second World War, there was something important. We need to research into that in greater detail, but Art the way that we have it nowadays uh, in the form of documentation didn't exist before. People didn't have any cameras. Or oh, they had cameras, but very few. And then having a camera pursued another task. So art didn't, wasn't tasked with documenting war. Because usually they say, well, guns are working, muses are silent. Therefore, if muses are silent, it's sitting and waiting until we are ready and can afford to talk about the beautiful things, to compose poetry and create paintings, works of art. So this is the time that we bide. The time of grieving must be over, and then we can move on to creating. Some 80 years ago, perhaps time It was a time for us to take a break, to reimagine, reconsider, and the attitude to time was very much different. However, nowadays we're not doing it like this. Artists are not standing aside because usually the artist would have to stand on the horizon observing what was taking place in reality, then digest it and provide his or her own reflections. We know that we, our artists, were also direct participants 
in the same uh, kinds of events. The artists in the broad meaning of this word, like Apollino, they, like Kirk, Kirchner, went to war. But this was not a massive phenomenon. It was rather an individual decision taken by artists. However, nowadays, the situation is quite different. We are all eyewitnesses. We are all documenting, doing it in different ways. Once again, getting back to Zontag, the artist who says, are you sure that photographers who film these events are documenting? When they come back, if something is over, they select an angle. Sometimes they remove something. We're not talking about specific instances, but we know that such instances have happened. And the pictures on, on Times magazine covers were refined. One of the most famous photographs, for example, uh, for example of uh, the London Blitz, where three gentlemen are picking up books from a, a ruined library. So this was an orchestrated uh, photo shoot. But wasn't it about documenting war? It was definitely about the war. So this fine line is not so important as as is what is unfolding in the eyes of the artist or a photographer. And the, the form in which you are documenting probably is of lesser importance compared to the content. Zontag has been quoted by so many concerning uh, the point of appropriating the tragedy, what we do to the survivor's tragedy when we uh, record it, what we do to it, we appropriate it. Something that the previous speaker has already spoken about, about appropriating th the way that artists work. So we pursue different tasks and documentary videographers and photographers will be doing all that they have in order to distance themselves from this experience, whereas artists will probably gain permission to interpret this particular experience, knowing that these works are not going to be presented in courtrooms, although nowadays this is not particularly so. So romanticization and heroization of tragedies, etc. But is it a document or not? That's the question. It seems to me that this is not the most important question. The question is, what is behind that? What underpins that because not every documentary photograph will be impactful on judicial decisions just like not every artistic work or an exhibition will do the same i have my own memories to cherish when we were just beginning exhibitions in europe one of our first expositions was in berlin dedicated to recorded the first months of this war and its interpretation. On the other hand, we had a lot of documentary photography. And this was the month of May. And back then, it was already clear that it was impossible to speak to the, generally speaking, European audiences with the help of news coverage and breaking news, because the people were already, frankly speaking, tired. And this universal artistic language or parlance in a way was one of the ways where people were ready to commit and to engage in this conversation because on the one hand they could have turned on their TVs and stop reading news. On the other hand though people are always interested to go to see something artistic, reflect on that and not just speak about the horrors of war, though this is our primary task, to share with the world what's going on here, but to do it in a way um, so that the people are ready to do it. And here, art commits to another very important function, something that it did not previously was responsible for, to engage in a dialogue at the level of the emotion that the audience is already to engage in. And these audience members uh, are very much limited in the spectrum of their emotional expression. So at that time, it was a kind of uh, 
overall artistic experience uh, when we were ready for interpretations as well as the audience members. But every time I go somewhere, I always catch myself thinking, okay, so how are we going to speak? What are we going to speak about and communicate? So in the project right now that we are trying to exhibit, we are telling about children's stories, which is hard on the one hand, while on the other hand, this topic is something that many are ready to pay attention to. And here we have to be very cautious because there are lots of different practices on the one hand. On the other hand, we must make sure that the children's experience doesn't get instrumental or it doesn't get exploited, rather. So today is the day of mental health. And children, participants of our project, share their own experiences. And all of this was part of the exhibition uh, with this artistic dimension, although it's not so much artistic but document documentary at the same time. And it's so interesting the way that they were sharing their experiences. And one interesting experience, um, insight, that I, which is not to do with that, but I have to express it in this context. As usual, different therapeutic practices are highly to do with getting this trauma from inside. You have to share it. And I'm not sure this is always the case. Thank you. And to bring our panel to a close and your remarks. In the first place, I would like to quote the Nobel Prize winner, Alexandra Matvichuk, a Ukrainian, who said that we are documenting not the violations of the Geneva or the Hague Convention, but we are recording and documenting people's pain. And your exhibition, according to the expression of one of our panel panelists, said uh, that these exhibitions enable us to articulate the experience of billions and billions of suffering people. And thirdly, I very much invite you to the Hanan Kaus Museum in Kiev, where there is right now an exhibition on, which is entitled The Language of War. I wrote about these exhibitions. All of these statements that we have articulated today concerning art as a, a way to document history are very much evident. I had something else in my mind, but it's just escaped me, because we can speak endlessly about art. I thank you very much indeed for your participation, because on the one hand, it seemed to me that this topic was terribly narrow, but Natalia, your museum, Andri, photography, Irina, documentary theater, and Katya, huge thank you for um, framing all of this. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. A huge thank you to Yulia Manukyan, the moderator. And the next announcement to make next is the lunch break that we're going to take time for networking and communicating because the main value of this communicating is to be in touch with the people who are like minded individuals. So you are on the same wavelength and you share the same values. So you will be able to enjoy your lunch here in this space, but on the third floor, because right now we are on minus first floor, so you can also go all the way up to the third floor. You can take an escalator or a lift. You will be able to get there to the terrace, and there at 1900 hours, we will also set up opportunities for your networking. So please make sure that you have your lunch quickly, that you can get back here before 1700 hours when we begin the next keynote speech. At this war, everyone has their own story to tell. We have seen something that we will never forget, something that no one has the right to forget. The museum, the voices of the civilians, or the civilian voices are run by Renan Ahmeta Foundation. It's the largest museum to share the collection of stories of the people who have been affected by the Russo-Ukrainian war. So watch, read, and tell.
Дорогі друзі, зараз це ще не точка офіційного старту, і ще буквально пару хвилин для того, аби всі встигли спуститися, для того, аби всі встигли зібратися і налаштуватися на третю заключну частину роботи нашого форуму. Uh, oral history of Ukraine. This will be the final part, and we have our last keynote speaker. Please get back to the room and take your seat before we start. We start again in a minute. Дорогі друзі, і ще раз вас вітаю. Я сподіваюся, всі, хто роз... Hello, everyone. Welcome again to those who plans to uh, continue with our forum, and we can start our final third part of our forum. And we are starting with another key note speech a speech from a person that represents one of the partner partners oral history association and executive director of the oral history association stephen stone and uh, a couple of words about this speaker stephen sloan is specialized in oral and public history his first academic position was a co-director of the oral history center uh, oral history and, coral, uh, and, and a cultural history center. He became a professor of um, oral history institute, institute 
in Bangalore University within the community. He's a uh, executive director of the association. He's the author of different publications dedicated to oral history and Second World War. He worked with people who liberated concentration camp and those and, and the genocide survivors. He was awarded with uh, numerous uh, awards for different oral history projects, and his keynote speech is about fixing of uh, today in oral history uh, its role during the crisis. Dr. Sloan. Thank you for the invitation, and it is an honor to uh, be uh, talking to you this evening. Um, you, I'm sure you've had a, a day, a very enriching day of, of presentations, and so I, I'm honored to be with joining you from the United States. I, as was said, I'm the executive director of the Oral History Association here in the USA. We are the principal um, place for uh, oral historians of all walks in whatever the area they are working in. And so I want to address just a little bit uh, what I see as the theme of this conference and, and the hopes of this gathering and give you a little context on similar work that's been going on in the United States. Really since the uh, attacks of September 11, 2001, oral history work in the U.S. has seen a dramatic rise in the number of oral history projects dealing with crisis or disaster or wartime settings. Uh, in fact, in recognition of this, in 2005, the Oral History Association, the organization that I lead, established an Emerging Crises Award, uh, and that is just six months before Hurricane Kat Katrina struck the United States, a very devastating hurricane. And for 20, 20 years now, the Oral History Association has been sponsoring field work around the world with oral history. Uh, very international, China, Colombia, Nicaragua, Mexico, Egypt, Cameroon, Thailand, Malaysia, and Italy. These are uh, varied investigators in many different crisis settings, trying to use oral history as a way to understand phenomenon in the midst of post-catastrophe or during crisis environments. Uh, if we think about the rise of crisis oral history, um, there are really a, a host of motivations for people that do this sort of work in the U.S. I would say most blend two things. One is really a desire to inquire uh, and to understand and to document in real time um, as crisis is unfolding. And two, there is a humanitarian response uh, to a need, a real need uh, to understand and for people to be heard during times of crisis. When fueled by that empathy, uh, oral historians create an atmosphere of advocacy uh, for the narrators or the interviewees they work with. Uh, oral history has the ability to put people, uh, not the devastation, uh, not the war, not the disaster at the center of the story, but it centers people's experiences and people's stories. Uh, it is an effort, as I know many of you know who have been doing oral history, that it is very fraught with challenges. There are many challenges that this sort of work presents. Uh, but it's done in a period that is very insightful, uh, a very insightful and unique time within which to be conducting research. Um, it is a period where we've found that the larger strengths or weaknesses of a society really become quite visible during times of crisis or catastrophe. Uh, stress uh, can reveal, for example, often obscured elements that exist in the society, and this can do with race, class, and gender. Uh, these are also occasions that dis disclose in very real ways the relationship between a state and its people societal, political, cultural, and economic realities emerge during times of crisis that may not be evident during times of peace. A crisis also offers a unique opportunity to explore broader issues of faith and spirituality. Those things emerge in crisis in a way that they don't during calmer times. One thing that we've seen in the United States as we've done more and more of this work 
uh, in the U.S. And as we've talked to researchers that are doing more and more of this work abroad, is some very common questions that emerge. Uh, one of them is, does this sort of work help the narrator? Does this help the interviewee cope uh, with what they are dealing with uh, amid times uh, of catastrophe or post-crisis? Um, this idea of what does it mean for the oral historian to take the position of the other, a listener, uh, standing beside those that are in times of crisis. Uh, work that is done not not generally post-crisis but amid crisis what does it mean to listen to the story of another um, when I think about that I think about oral history in three ways uh, there is the project value of oral history as we conduct research we want to deal with our research questions and answer those questions there is also the private value of oral history. What does it mean for the individual that we work with for them to tell their story at that time? What is the meaning of that? And how do we honor the project value well? How do we accomplish our project names? But how do we also attend to the private value of oral history? Many people that I've worked with that are experiencing times of loss, their stories, their experiences are the most valuable possessions that they have. And so how do we steward those stories well is a good question with the private value of oral history. And also the public value, the long-term value of oral history. Uh, how do we present it to the public? How do we ensure that it has a public outlet going forward? Is something that requires oral historians to not only think about now, but think about long-term in the way that we record, in the way that we prepare to present the findings that come from our interviews to a larger audience. We're all trying to bring attention to these stories. And so how do we do that well is, is a big concern of oral historians amid crisis. Uh, so does it help the narrator is, is one question. But, and I think the, the question can be, I think we've come to the point we realize there, is, there can be great benefit uh, from sharing their story. We don't use the term healing can come from just sharing the story, but we agree there can be great benefit from sharing stories during crisis. Uh, another common question that comes from this, and this may be of interest to some of you that are conducting these interviews, is how does this sort of work affect the interviewer? How does it impact the interviewer to hear these sorts of stories? Um, a project that I mentioned early on is a project that was done on 9-11 uh, in the United States. Columbia University launched a very large uh, project on 9-11, those that impacted from that. Uh, in the design of that project, uh, they had mental health professionals available to work with people that were interviewed for the project. Um, as the project ran its course, those mental health professionals ended up primarily working with interviewers uh, on the project. Those that heard these stories of loss, those who heard these stories of grief, one after another after another. Uh, even here at the Institute for Oral History, I've had the experience of transcribers uh, working with uh, interviews on difficult material and being exposed uh, to these stories. Uh, there is no doubt that doing this, sorts of, this sort of work has a big impact on the interviewer. The interviewer can be a vulnerable observer uh, in the process. Uh, vicarious trauma that is experienced, uh, the trauma that is experienced by the narrator can become a vicarious trauma that is taken on by the interviewer themselves. Sometimes interviewers, and we know this in the field of psychology, they talk a lot about compassion fatigue, that empathy that we can become hardened to the stories that we hear, and we must, uh, we must guard against that as well. It is true to do this work well as an interviewer. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, insight into what's going on with you as you conduct your project. It takes additional support, ex additional external support, to support you as you do this sort of work. Uh, it is not a work that you can remain neutral in. It's a very difficult work to remain neutral in. And so support needs to be around you as you do it. So the, 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 the last question I would say that's been raised as this work has been done is how do you do it well? 
uh, done poorly, a work in the midst of crisis can seem exploitive. Uh, it can seem a voyeuristic, uh, opportunistic, or even harmful. Uh, you have narrators who may be very vulnerable. Um, and so this sort of work amid crisis really dictates a very flexible uh, approach and a very sensitive approach. It's made us rethink a lot of our best practices uh, in the U.S. in dealing with this sort of population. Uh, we do several things to uh, try to address that. One thing that we advise is pursuing a life history. Um, a lot of difficult memories, or we can call them hot memories, uh, come at us uncontrolled. Uh, they visit us in dreams. They overwhelm us and we don't expect them. Doing life stories allows our narrators to weave some of these hot memories, these difficult memories that they may have experienced backed into some of the colder memories and the normal memories of a life lived. Uh, integrating uh, these hotter stories or difficult memories back into a longer life narrative, we know that can be quite beneficial for those that we work with. Um, also, we found uh, that public purpose that I talked about sometimes can be quite beneficial uh, for the narrators that we worked with. Uh, one project, uh, the, again, the project on 9-11, uh, a psychologist worked with uh, individuals to do oral histories that had a public purpose in them working through their issues, not just a private purpose that you would just expect to therapy. And people became very engaged and excited about their stories being shared and helping others and having a meaning and getting the word out. So this sort of work, as we work with our interviewees, our narrators, uh, not all of our narrators are ready uh, to tell their stories, and we must be very sensitive to that and be careful as we go about our work. Uh, but oral history can help us understand, in their words, on their terms, from their experience, it really allows participants, our interviewees, our narrators, to take back the narrative it makes uh, their experience, what they've experienced, the experience once again. And, and we allows us, as it's captured, to speak that experience boldly to others in the process. Uh, oral history in many ways has always been about crisis, turning points, conflicts, uh, societal or cultural train, change, transition or disaster. Uh, that sits at the heart uh, of oral history. If you look at um, social cultural change in the United States or conflicts in the United States over the last 75 years, wherever you might find them, oral historians have generally been there seeking to understand. So in these settings, in these sorts of uh, conflict or crisis settings, uh, in the environments in which you are now working, uh, is also revealed the elements that make oral history so compelling, so powerful as a source of research. It's valuable, it's invaluable, it's creating a primary source unlike any other primary source. And it, and it shows its distinctiveness in these sorts of settings, working very differently than a journalistic approach, um, than a sensationalist approach, but really seeking to understand the experience around us. Uh, there is not uh, one conflict uh, going on in your country. There's many different conflicts, and those emerge uh, in the narrators and in the stories in which you gather. We are grateful to partner with you uh, as you pursue this work. I'm so glad to see this initial gathering of those who are engaged in this important work in Ukraine. Uh, we send you our well wishes uh, from the United States, from the many oral history practitioners here. We are inspired by the effort that you are making uh, to understand this in the midst uh, of the ongoing conflict. Thank you. Thanks a lot to Stephen Sloan. I hope that uh, you found it useful and you will have a lot to discuss based on this keynote speech and then we're moving on to the third panel of today's forum 
that brings us into the future documentation of ex war experiences in the future and during that discussion the participants of that panel will discuss the meaning of these documented uh, experiences for advocacy on the international field and for post-war justice personally I'm looking forward to it as a journalist maybe there will be some hints some cues or visions can these oral history tools give you an answer to the question how do you communicate our experience to the countries of a global south and also how can a, the general archive can look like or maybe it's a s ultimate centralized storage for these stories may be funded by the state or maybe it should be a cloud-based storage with lots of initiatives and and when we will be talking about these initiatives because you represent many of them moderator is a cultural uh, criticist Anastasia Platonova she's uh, specialized in and memory credit memory based criticism and culture can you hear me thank you very much for the introduction alexi thanks a lot to everyone that gathered here after the lunch it's a great honor for me to moderate this final panel of today's forum because we have fantastic speakers today and it's also it feels like a, a great happiness for me to moderate this panel when we talk about different initiatives that document uh, borderline aspects of the war. And we said that we are in the situation of an ongoing war and we're all exhausted and it, and these are very painful, uh, real experiences. And I think that in this context, context a possibility, there's a this possibility to talk, to talk about the future is very therapeutic and in the context of the future there are things that need to be spoken out and touched in order to create something new and as Alexei said in the final panel we're talking about the future of documentation initiatives in Ukraine and also maybe the influence of this field and with this area to uh, other areas of life and uh, post-war justice because we can see that there is a huge demand for justice and uh, for Ukraine's advocacy in the international field. Let me introduce fantastic speakers that we have. Dr. Pyotr Tsivinsky, historian, director of Auschwitz-Birkenau History Museum and uh, Auschwitz Food Feninau uh, Fund. He's from an expert from a cultural um, foundation, Natalia Mikolska, Mikolska uh, representative of the Antalion project that documents uh, Russian crimes. And online, we're having Alexandra Matvichuk, a civil activist and uh, head of the Center of Civil Liberties. Today, dear friends, I want us to talk about different areas <clears throat> which directly or indirectly can be affected by the documented evidence and experiences of war. And the first area that I would like us to touch upon is the international communications, international diplomacy, cultural, public, human rights. Starting with February 24th last year, I suppose everyone will agree that our external communications and the tasks which has to do with Ukraine's advocacy have scaled up externally outside Ukraine. <clears throat> and we have scaled up our audiences that we are reaching out to. We are not only speaking with the Euro-Atlantic world, we are also reaching out to Global South and other cultural and geographic contexts, some of which have really uh, difficult to deal with. Some of them have been through the experiences of genocides and contemporary wars. Therefore, we have to be really responsible in terms of forming, shaping our message, 
in terms of how we apply various documented experiences, and we do that in exactly in order to share history in the global sense of this word, to talk about this word so that we are heard, so that the world knows proper, correct truth about what's going on in Ukraine. And that's something I would like to get us started with. So how shall we apply and use this documented experience of war with a view to this diplomatic international communication uh, purpose in order to get hurt. Well, so let me, I suppose this is your purview. This is your area of competence. So let's, you just kick in. Let's kick it off with you. I thought that I would finish this round. I thought that everyone would be talking about documentation. But anyway, I will start. Concerning communication, as I was getting ready for this panel discussion, I thought back to Susan Zontag with her nowadays classic encyclopedical example of others' pain in her essay about other people's pain. This experience of Bosniaks and Ethiopians whether it was the same curator or organize, organizer wanted to bring these exp uh, exhibitions in the same uh, gallery. And you remember this history, historical accounts, this happened in the 1990s, very tragic for the Bosniaks and Ethiopians, Bosniaks in particular. And Susan Zonta gets to describe it in very meticulous detail and something significant about the story which was uh, very informative for me and everyone who has read this essay is that when the diaspora of Ethiopia and Bosnia came to the gallery they were absolutely critical dismissive of the curator's decisions to bring together the pain of ours, the true pain of Bosniaks, with a distant and unreal pain of Ethiopia, and vice versa, our real true pain of Ethiopia, the only actual pain with unrealistic white uh, Caucasian pain of Bosniaks. So this example has been living with me since those days, and I decided to verify it through my friends over the last three days. So you did your homework, right? Preparing for this panel discussion. Yes, I did. And something that I wanted to share with you is this point. I asked my colleagues how meticulously and in to what degree of detail are you reading nowadays about the conflict in the Middle East, in Israel, and it was a small sampling of people. It's not, of course, statistics based. Some people keep saying, I'm unwilling. I have so much pain. I'm reluctant to read about what's happening in Israel. I have so many snapshots, so many different graphic images in my mind. That's enough for me. And now would like to, to get you all provoked. So how easy is it? To what extent does it make sense? To what percentage? Uh, should you speak in your communications about our pain and how to speak about that? Because without data, without certain facts, um, this will not be evidence-based. So I decided to uh, fix my attention on a few points and perhaps at, later on we will get back to communications. First of all, it seems to me still that we have to break through this absolutely absurd level of misunderstanding, which is there between Ukrainians and other nations which are so far away from us, like the countries of Africa, South American countries, and uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Why do I s say that this is absurd? Because when you see two, three good, very people, as soon as they begin to speak about their experiences, about divisions about the things that they have lived through. There's an immediate barrier wall. And it emerges just because we know very little about each other. So what can be done about that by Ukrainians living in Ukraine? So how should Ukraine communicate about ourselves? In the first place, we have to be open to empathy, to um, embracing new 
information like we have to get open to I would like to quote Anton Drabovich and his today's article in the Ukrainian truth there is the benchmark um, a genocide and assimilating one this benchmark genocide is taking place today and now in Darfur so how much to what extent are we thinking about that assimilating and difficult to prove genocide is also taking in the southern and eastern regions of Ukraine so how much are we thinking about that how are we imagining that how open are we to talk about that um, in the face of our traumas and emotions affected by this war, to speak about that openly. Unfortunately, if your purpose is to get heard, so this is about still opening yourself up to the others. Another uh, point about the construction action point, something that I have prepared both for myself and you, we have to look for common ground and not to tag things even when you enter difficult audiences to handle. Some different people have different ideas of easy and difficult audiences. I can say about myself, I may be wrong about that, I'm ready to argue. But easy audiences are perhaps the audiences that knew at least something about the pre-war Ukraine. Well, we don't have to start from scratch. And difficult are the ones that knew nothing about Ukraine before the full-scale invasion. And for them, I would say it's probably like a quote. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but it's like this. It's like a quote. One, some, one type of Russians fighting another type of Russians. We have a lot of countries thinking so about the conflict in Ukraine. The army of Ukraine managed to do so much so that the whole world knows that it's not one type of Russians fighting another group of Russians. So what is to be the next step, a constructive one? I suppose that these should be common topics without labeling, without putting on tags, without hurrying to call something colonization or genocide. Let's set an example to follow what's happening here. The people who are open to other people's experiences will probably build some neural connections with other experiences and will think, oh, oh, okay. so I can relate to that. This is called colonial policy, etc. But the problem is that there are others who don't want to build any neural connections like this. Probably at another type with other resources we'll have to handle that. And the third point that I wanted to make, there are certain lenses people in the developmental project sector in particular, they know that there are some lenses that help them to speak ontologically about some broader topics. And these lenses help us to touch these things like gender lenses, environmental lenses, some other common points. to make sure that the stories that you try to get through to other audiences may be heard in a better way. And this is my third action point, I like eating that elephant bit by bit. Difficult topics to digest. I think these are additional lenses that captivate our ears, eyes, the attention of different audiences that might be helpful in this respect. The people and colleagues, counterparts of ours who have been working in Africa, maybe you have, you know how much helpful it is to work with women in different communities in Africa. I don't think that this is the uh, well-designed and decided strategy of the institution that I represent because we don't have it uh, very well finalized and formulated, but these are definitely the lenses that I will be discussing together with my counterparts and uh, colleagues because the experience attests that it actually makes sense. Thank you very much. Some things that I can resonate, that resonates with me that I'm not going to put on tags or labels and I will not try to speak about things, uh, the definitions of which we simply don't know about. Like today, we have been speaking about such varied and scary, horrific experiences that there is no vocabulary yet, no way to talk about this in an empathetic, acceptable way. This vocabulary is being formulated here and now. So it's absolutely necessary not to be hasty. And the second thought that has echoed with me is the importance of empathy so that both we and our audiences don't get traumatized at other times. Here, I would like to give the floor to Alexandra Matvichuk, 
at the Center of Civil Liberties, headed by her, is doing a lot for advocating the Ukrainian causes um, internationally. This is a powerful vocal voice of Ukraine. I would like to give the floor to her, and could you kindly speak about your institutional experience concerning how to share the experience of Ukraine about the ongoing war, and at the same time use the documented experiences and testimonies in order to do it properly and most efficiently. So the floor is yours, Alexandra. Thank you very much for the floor. Actually, what we faced is uh, the world is interrelated, and before we just knew that uh, people's battle in Iran, it affects the world. Now I live in Kiev, and my city is under shelling, just like uh, dozens of cities shelled by Russian and Iranian drones. And we need to build horizontal links with different parts of the world that we never faced before that we never worked with before on these levels. And now we face this challenge, turning this lack of knowledge into um, new relations and uh, the possibility to tell our Ukrainian story and being able to listen stories from other countries and con continents. And my experience showed me that there are three bridges that help us fill the, this gap and they are useful to us right now. The first bridge is values. When you explain what we are fighting for to people that have it as a value and you tell about examples that Ukrainians fight for freedom in all senses. Freedom to be an uh, independent country, not a Russian colony. Uh, liberty to be Ukrainians, not having to raise our children as Russians. Having a democratic choice to build your country where uh, the freedoms are protected. And we started to do that since the revolution of dignity when it started as a peaceful protest and it ended with shootings with murders and the fall of authoritarian regime and people can relate to that and people start listening to you but values are different and the value hierarchy is different and there's a second breach that helps you to uh, fill this gap. It's a shared experience. So it can be similar, it can be different, but what I faced, there was a specific situation where at a meeting in uh, Argentina, it's a meeting with pro-Russian politicians, I told a story about a family from Mariupol. It's a father with three children that tried to bring them to a safer space and he was detained at a filtration camp and he was tortured in filtration camps. The children were separated and brought to Russia and they prepared them for forced ado adoption. And I watched the counterparty and I and I noticed the tears in their eyes and then I reminded myself that this is Argentina because they had this military junta and what people from Ukrainian diaspora told me about there are people 60 year old 6 uh, 40 year old they uh, they sometimes they dig their past and they find out that they were adopted and they were separated from their families. So they can relate and this pain is common and it is doesn't matter what your political preference is. And there's, th there's a third bridge that helps when the previous two didn't work. It's called we're only human. When you talk to people about Russian atrocities, mother's pain that lost 
her newborn child and she hold it she held it in her hand and then a Russian missile destroyed her building and it just destroyed her the whole world for her and it turns out that it doesn't matter who what nationality you are what kind of uh, citizenship do you have what's your color of your skin what's your ideology political views and We are still people, we are still humans, and uh, you can appeal to that. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for the statement about experiences. Even within Ukrainian society, the experience is different, and sometimes they are very different, and uh, it complicates the dialogue. But at the same time, there are experiences that you don't have to have in order to understand the person. It doesn't require translation. This fantastic story about Argentinian politicians tells us that uh, you don't know what, uh, you know, how can you reach to people. So thank you very much, Alexander. I would like to give the floor to Natalia Mikulska, the person that has uh, a lot of uh, civil rights competencies and uh, there's the same question to you thank you very much I represent uh, that alien project that's no, that's not a data lion it's a data battalion it's short for data battalion <laughs> it's a project that it is less human rights oriented we're m mostly public a free uh, database of aggregated multimedia data. We aggregate photos and videos from different sources from the first day of the war. And we also have a database of verified witnesses. We don't call it, we don't call them crime witnesses because I'm a lawyer with a big experience. I understand that not all of the atrocities uh, happening in Ukraine can be qualified as war crimes. We have different 220 stories about the terrors of war. And getting back to the narratives and the history, the project was conceived in order to provide journalists with access to photo and video information about the first days of the war in Ukraine, because you remember we did have a foreign journalists. Those who uh, were here they were forbidden to uh, get out of the uh, spa hotels because the first stories that you've heard on uh, BBC's they were broadcasted from Hyatt hotel or spa hotels and other fancy places because uh, they're basically uh, they basically sit in the basement from Lviv and Uzhgorod Western Ukrainian city. So we made sure that y foreign journalists can use that footage and include that in their stories. And it was created for narratives. Now we have turned basically into a photo and video database, a multimedia aggregated database, as we call it. And the transformation happened to uh, communicate these narratives and what we've uh, found out. I mean, the reason why we have witnesses, the world needs to need stories. And uh, people just at some point they started hating uh, looking at these videos and yeah, photos. People are um, engaged with human stories. So we've selected 220 stories and we selected them from different categories of people, women interpreters we have a special tag for that uh, destroyed businesses or restored businesses doctors teachers we have different witnesses and what's very important we try to appeal to uh, professional communities uh, there's a great power in these communities doctors I would rather believe a doctor as a witness and they have a larger level of trust when uh, one of our 
witness had a speech at a uh, large medical congress and he shared his story in Mariupol and the response would be so much higher than that of a minister of healthcare because he uh, told about operating doing a surgery during the shelling so this this is a personal component yes uh, speaking a common language and a high level of trust professional trust because we are looking for that a mom would rather trust a mom and a lawyer would rather trust a lawyer and doctor would rather trust a doctor children would rather trust children and we also have a certain advocacy activities efforts now, that's not a primary work but what we've understood that photo and video content has a greater advocacy response with the stories than just figures and people are more attached to a emotion that they have experienced we on the previous panel we've said that people that create evidence that they are, they, they are taught how not to create a picture of their own picture of this evidence and it's it's more uh, entangled it's more integrated with people than just a set of numbers and this content is not just used by us but also by other organizations for advocacy purposes and if we think that the world has seen it all from Ukraine all the pictures all the videos no it's not the case even when we talk to the US congressman not all of US congressmen even those that support Ukraine not all of them have seen it all all of the atrocities all of the suffers sufferings and I will just emphasize on some of one of the things during the start of the war we had a closed meetings with the congressmen and congresswomen where we had witnesses that told their stories and we provided some numbers and at some point when we showed them videos uh, filmed on the smartphones by one of the witnesses we saw the faces of the congressmen and this one of the men had a tear in his eyes because that was filmed by a real person that survived occupation in Bucha and um, you could hear how these uh, cars were shot at uh, because he forgot to turn off his phone and I realized that there is a great power in this uh, video in um, audio content for advocacy purposes. Thank you very much, Natalia. I would like to give the floor to another guest, Dr. Piotr Cevinsky. Dr. Cevinsky, as part of this panel, is the only speaker. He's, he's an, an outsider, although he's very friendly to Ukraine, and also his experience is focused on the experience of Second World War and stories that were documented and I guess your perspective on how the documented experience of the war can help tell the story the truth about that war and how can we tell these stories while the war is ongoing because the memory is French and there are lots of different factors oh, good 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 afternoon I'm sorry, I will not be speaking Ukrainian, but Polish. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's extremely important for me. Honestly speaking, I don't know how to tell about these stories of ongoing war, because if when talking about the Second World War, I wasn't even born then.
I suppose that you in Ukraine in this respect have much more experience, which is really empathetic. I do not remember a single military war conflict that would be so well and vividly reported to be uh, talked about abroad, this particular country. You are in a much better situation, perhaps, because you have dozens of thousands of people who can speak freely. And if the second party wants to show their truth, they just show the face of Lavrov, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia, who is not sympathetic at all. Naturally, this information is perceived differently by different regions of, Ukra of Europe, which for a long time has known Russia. And by another part of Europe, the perception of the situation varies. However, I still think that further stages of this documentation will take place, which will be of great significance. Because after informing, another stage will come, legal stage will come, prosecution. And it is on the basis of this evidence, of these accounts, prosecutors in the future will easily locate the people who will become eyewitnesses in, uh, in uh, court trials. Next, the so-called historic period will follow, and for historians it will be incredibly phenomenal information, valuable material to work with, because if we speak about family stories, local stories, this will be indispensable. Then the so-called educational period will ensue because the children who will be born later on in 20 years' time Fortunately, they will not remember this, but for them, this will be incredibly valuable material due to which they will understand their national identity. If we speak about the so-called oral history, this war may look quite different from all of the previous wars known to us. I don't know how many people in Ukraine use mobile telephones, but I can say definitively that five to seven million telephones contain living footage of uh, the um, periods of war. And if on every phone there are 50 to 100 photos contained, then due to that we will end up having hundreds of millions of photographic images. And every snapshot contains its meta metadata, localization, time, 
while the snapshot was taken and the details of the uh, telephone itself. If one could manage to establish one platform, a single platform to which all of these photos could be sent, then the future of memory would be exceptional. And this could create something unique if we compare this war with all of the predecessors. For example, imagine someone telling you, if we're talking about oral history, someone recounting the three tanks moved through the village. And imagine then 10 years from then, having this single database of photographic images, a historian studying this material based on the hours, place of location and the date of this instance of this happening could locate an image with those three tanks. And this has never happened and nowhere. And this can drastically change the future of memory. And if we're talking about this oral history as such, and I have already mentioned mobile telephones, cell telephones, I think it's worth doing it even now, because people unfortunately tend to change telephones after a while. And unfortunately, the photos taken at the beginning of the war will begin to disappear from such telephones. Thank you very much, Piotr. We will still have time to speak to you. See, the audience immediately wants to respond to your statements. Thanks a lot. We'll definitely have some more time to speak about the um, future model of the archives of war, what those could be, and what our experts think about that. But now I would like us to delve deeper into one of the aspects that Mr. Tsevinsky has just alluded to, the importance of the documented experiences of war for the post-war justice, for the fullness of its accomplishment, and for the revision of the global security system in the world, which it seems to me since the uh, breakout of this war, Russia has been able to prove that it's a, all of these rules are irrelevant. So I would like us to talk about how this documented evidence of war could be helpful and useful in terms of achieving post-war justice, because Ukrainians very well understand no one else will do it for us. This is our task, a tremendously important one to achieve. So where, what should be our purposes, goals to pursue, and some of the undercurrents endangering this process in order to achieve this justice that we are talking about repeatedly today for this task to be implemented. So who will start? I would like to give the floor to Alexandra Mastvichuk, who has a lot to add. Alexandra, please. Indeed, it's necessary to start by saying that now in 2023, we have all of these digital opportunities for documenting and recording military crimes, war crimes, and even identifying the perpetrator, something that we couldn't possibly have dreamed 30 years ago. And for me, very eloquent and illustrative is the story of one of the pictures taken during the Balkan Wars. And this is a picture which is easy to Google where a Serbian military man standing with his back to the photographer is beating an elderly woman lying on the ground and next to this woman there are two more civilian men and there is a pool of water next to them and when looking at this picture it seems to you that it's very likely that these three people are long dead and the Serbian 
servicemen is just kicking their uh, dead bodies. Just a year ago, international journalists decided to explore the story behind this picture. And they established, utilizing open information sources exceptionally, who exactly this man standing with his back uh, was. And they realized that he became a successful DJ. He was never punished. And he still plays in different concerts and gigs. So my point is, now we have all of these possibilities that we couldn't have possibly dreamed about due to the vibrant development of digital technologies. But the problem is that the legal system and the global approach to justice for international crimes, it's not developing as vibrantly as technologies. And very often I'm confronted by two problems in uh, the perception of the world that diminish, reduce the spaces and room for our goals to be pursued. The point is that the world, unfortunately, is still looking at such processes via Nuremberg Tribunal experience. It's important, but now it's 75, even 80 years on. And these tribunals where military uh, criminals were condemned and convicted only after the collapse of their regime. But it's important to underscore that right now we are living in a new century. We cannot wait. And justice cannot depend on when and how these wars will finish. After the Second World War, after this series of tribunal trials, there was a whole a new architecture created uh, accompanied by conventions. So if it's now that we have to establish the special tribunal on aggression and bring Putin, Lukashenko, and the supreme leadership of the Russian Federation to account. There's another flaw in the world perception of the situation. Still, it is believed, commonly believed, that this is sad, it's a tragedy, but after all of these tragedies a lot of people will have. They're doomed to remain uh, being pursue, being, not being able to pursue justice. So the approach is that people just turn into figures, into numbers, but I strongly believe that people are no numbers and that with the help of these new digital technologies, in our 21st centuries, we have every chance and even an obligation to provide access to justice to every individual affected by these crimes and offenses, regardless of who these people are, what their uh, social status may be, what atrocities or brutal treatment they may have uh, survived, whether international media are interested in the fate of these people or not. because. Every person's life matters, and it's only justice that can make these people's name be known and heard. And it seems to me that it's the world perception, world views, these two distorted lenses, unfortunately, that are still present uh, in the global perception. They determine to a great extent our actions, our thoughts. Our thoughts, once again, determine our reality to put it bluntly. Thank you very much, Alexandra. That's exactly what I mean when I speak about the necessity to review and revisit the global security system, which you say has already a well-set norm that after wars and genocides, in, even in contemporary history, it's far from reality that everyone will be able to receive justice. I very much want to expect that this war will be different in this context. Now I have to ask the most rankling and painful issue in this conversation. Do you think our war will become a game changer in terms of uh, receiving and detaining never again principle. I think we have a good chance of reaching that. It's very hard for me to predict the future and uh, make forecasts what happens. The only thing I'm sure about what we need to do together personally, we need to do what it takes to build the version of the future that we're striving for. Thanks a lot, Alexandra. That's really a good forecast. Natalia, the floor is yours. Thanks. It's very hard for me to talk about that as a international lawyer by education with my 
professional experience. Well, let's say that Datalion is a volunteer project. We have volunteers. We are not professional uh, historians or uh, social scientists or anything. Most of our people are business people that trust data. We started working on that because as business people, we've realized that our, every decision that we made in our life was based on data and photos on videos on multimedia data. And when you have data, it's very hard to say that black is white and white is black. You can talk about shades of gray, but it's very hard to say uh, that something never happened when you have data when you have proof uh, you can interpret the data but you can't say it never happened so one of the tasks of our project is uh, to uh, not to let people rewrite history and to show what really happened from the Ukrainian point of view from the eyes of Ukrainians and because as Piotr said that now we have lots of uh, smartphones and iPhones and iPads it's a, one of the biggest concentration of uh, smartphones in any war and I will be talking about challenges that we face when we collect these photos and videos not all metadata can be copied together with the photos when you copy files from one resource to another not all people want to share metadata when we collected these files we sometimes had to delete the photo these data, this metadata so that the people under occupation could not be identified it's a huge array of unprecedented data nobody ever experienced and we don't have answers to lots of questions I really liked the previous panels it was mentioned that we can't just use methodologies they used before and it was reaffirmed by our colleague who said that we can't just use uh, methodologies used under used during the Second World War and use it now? Uh, there, there was a project in uh, Hoover's Institute in Stanford. My and, and and the colleague is documenting the Second World War and the larger part of their recommendations. They cannot be applied here. We can't apply them because. Um, a greater part of the, uh, our material, our data was filmed using s gadgets and smartphones. And the fact that we have lots of multimedia data with locations, it's another great source that allow us to uh, restore justice and hold people accountable and also create a demand and create and, and change the world order because one of the purposes of our archive and our aggregated archive and our database is having a large number of uh, photos and videos so that organizations that are trying to hold Putin and other dictators accountable so that they have multimedia the right multimedia data and finally it's um, my personal reflection we are living in the area of artificial ex intelligence and I think it will allow us to hold uh, perpetrators accountable the more data we have to feed to AI, to train AI, including multimedia data, to train AI what's proper and what's not can help us in the future because we understand now that AI systems that we have right now, they were 
designed before the war in Ukraine and a larger amount of these systems they provide irrelevant analysis of what happens in Ukraine and, and on the world level well, uh, the floor is yours as a person that really values democracy and justice. I can talk for two days about that. Uh, sorry for that, but I can share something. Okay, you have 40 minutes. Uh, speaking about justice, uh, well, the way I hear about it, and sometimes I, I, I contemplate on that, sometimes people confirm that these crimes were committed and these predators need to be uh, punished. Yes, knowledge is important. It's important what happens with these people afterwards. Not this magic pill that they had in uh, the case of Serbia. Pol politics work in Hague and sometimes these pills show up in the wrong hands. And uh, because I think you feel that justice hasn't been delivered, we we wasn't we weren't ambitious enough with what we call justice. Another example: uh, riots in Baghdad, in Iraq, the victims' families that have proven that their family members were killed in Muslim countries. It gains uh, serious meaning if men suffered. That means losing a breadwinner, and they would receive a compensation for one family, $4,000. That's not too much even, the, even in the Iraqi context. And we have to be careful about what we call justice. In 1995, my grandpa received uh, as much money as allowed us to buy um, a cover, a bed cover. And my grandpa worked for two years in Nazi Germany, and he earned enough money to buy a bed cover and so we, we, we of course we keep it as a family uh, value and I will quote Aliftina Kahidze my colleague they took time out of us boycotting Russians doesn't happen it does happen for a reason and we lost many you lost much time. They took a lot of time from us. They took our life. And it's maybe a metaphor. They took a lifestyle that we had before. And it's also a, a valuable asset that we have to say goodbye to. That's another dimension of justice. Another thing, another practical thing I would like to mention, we need to record everything, not just the results of the war, not just the results of the war crimes. That's the first thing that comes to my, our mind. We have to record all of the predators that commit this injustice. I will give you an example. In the 90s, BBC uh, created a documentary uh, six episodes about Yugoslavia wars. I think they produced that uh, show in the 90s before the Dayton Agreement was signed that presumably uh, made peace in uh, Yugoslavia and then Srebrenica happened and genocide and everything and they um, they produced that movie, that show without any censorship and they didn't just um tell a story about the sufferings. They uh, also describe the motive, that show the motive. And it's not just an excess of a executor. These sufferings of millions of people that were documented is a strategy. It's not just uh, excess. And our northern predators 
will try to prove in courts and other platforms that they that this, that was a situation that was an excess and and the bad news is that our Ukrainian justice is also a good subject for a dialogue when I meet a person that talks about the war and actually means 2014 2015 I know where he's from even when I talk about the war I mean 2022 if the person is talking about the war in 2014 they survived that they, they probably from the east and this conversation about the eight years of war without manipulations but we will become even more mature if we talk about all the dimensions all periods of this war including uh, until 1991 and we did a focus group with women in Donbass different women from different regions and you think what united them is their husbands they either they were soldiers they fought in the war and one of the women said you know in my family the peace didn't start in 1945 it started in 1991 until my husband went to the front line and that was a great discovery for me as a researcher and by the way for these Donbass women that wasn't evident but they thanked me about this personal experience and um, I don't think uh, the Ukrainian war will change the world order and will lead to never again what started as a Ukrainian-Russian war in 2022 and uh, lots of geological and geopolitical processes started maybe this will be a start of another conversation about the world order thank you very much uh, Salome and Dr. Zavinsky I would like to listen to your perspective to your point of view on the every your view of the world new world order and uh, like whether this war can change the perspective I'm not an optimist. I think we can't talk about the new security system because there is no such thing as a UN. Who remembers these uh, blue helmets? Where were UN? Uh, blue helmets when there was a massacre in Myanmar it's an absolutely nonsense organization and secondly and let's look back in history who condemned any Turk that massacred Armenians Did anyone take anyone or take Pol Pot to court? There's still the four uh, criminal proceedings going on, and these will be final proceedings. If somebody thinks that the Nuremberg process was about justice, I will just remind you something. Overall, in all German concentration camp camps, more than 70,000 SS soldiers worked. One thousand seven hundred persons 
were persecuted. Majority of them received maximum five years in prison. And for majority of them, they uh, completed that sentence outside of the prison. And these were areas when uh, there were no Germans. They were mostly alliance troops, and uh, it was done where it will, how it was need to be done, needed to be done. Of course, I wish you. If we're talking about justice in this war, I I, I wish it. This is what happens on your side, but I'm not very optimistic about that. A very important link between what happened in the places the crimes were, were committed and the rhetoric that we've heard from Kremlin. So, as far as empathy is concerned, we know that we really want to record uh, the accounts of victims. But of course, we need not forget that uh, recording stories by Russian prisoners of war is important. We're not talking about uh, making them tell any war secrets because they can't do that. What we're talking about, they need to tell what, why a guy from Buryatia, Russia, ended up in, in Bucha, Ukraine. What were they promised? What they were told? How did they force them to do that? How did they motivate them to do that? It's so terrible because if we look at what happened in Mariupol and in Bucha, I think you agree that these are war crimes. Maybe some lawyers will say that these are crimes against humanity. But if we're talking about genocide, you need to show a link with that crime with what they were ordered, what kind of orders they were received. So therefore it will be not enough to condemn and convict those who acted directly in places where the direct perpetrators and remember those who are in the Kremlin. All of these things have to be clearly interconnected. Mm -hmm. 
Only when the trial in The Hague will be able to connect what happened in the places with what was said by the politicians in the Kremlin that Ukrainians as a nation don't exist, there is no nation like that, and there is not a country like Ukraine, only then can we speak about genocide. Because a genocide is a legal term, it's not a journalist or a political definition or a term. And given this, it is a fundamental meaning and significance to have the testimonies of the Russian captives, the military personnel and taken prisoner. Thank you very much, Peter, for reminding us about the importance to prove the effects of genocide, because this terminology that gained its definitions uh, in the period of the Second World War right now needs to be revised and reconsidered. As I was listening to you, I was thinking how important for justice it is to know a record and document the truth, because the other fellow speakers have also been speaking about the importance of punishment and how necessary it is to convey the truth to different audiences, because knowing, documenting, and sharing about the truth is the request which is very significant and very much in demand right now. We are not very much optimistic ourselves concerning our prospects in terms of proving the crimes committed by the Russians and uh, revising the whole security system. In here, in this panel, we have been speaking up to people with different kind of optics, different lenses utilized by them in order to understand the answers to the questions which unfortunately are not lending themselves to direct answers. So before we finish, you would like to respond, yeah? As I was talking about Burma and Turks, probably the only interesting, peculiar situation was also in Rwanda. This is probably the only case of genocide that was confirmed and condemned. Nearly 40,000 perpetrators were jailed. And until now, about 20,000 of those are still imprisoned. This process definitely took place according to a simplified procedure because the number of uh, the defendants was extremely big, but the main uh, figures, uh, the prosecutors, judges, and um, counsels for defense were definitely present in this, those trials. So there is already a precedent of the example of the so-called non-conventional approach. This was done in Rwanda without um, involvement of the global security uh, architecture. Thank you very much for this unprecedented illustration provided by you, Dr. Svinsensky. And now we have a few minutes left to speak about the future prospects. And let's just have two minutes per every panelist. And let's endeavor to answer the question how co documenting this evidence about the war will enable us to develop the um, history concerning the future and will help us to narrate the events unfolding right now in Ukraine in the future. Alexandra, the floor is yours. When we talk about documenting, we speak about what uh, purposes can we we can pursue? On the one hand, it can be facilitating justice, because the last part of our discussion was 
different kinds of illustrations in history of injustice in one way or another uh, they tr was being pursued to a greater or lesser degree of success. It's also about corroborating the truth and confirming a rightful, truthful picture of what happened. And I keep saying that Ukraine began to get uh, serious sanctions against Russia and weapons, not when the Russian troops were killing and torturing people in Irpin, Motyzhin, Warsaw, and Bucha, but when video and photo footage of those deoccupied, liberated places, inundated social networks, and people elsewhere in the world were horrified, and they saw the bodies of the civilians tossed around in the streets with their hands bound behind, tied up behind their backs. And they began to exert pressure on their governments for them to undertake decisive, resolute steps. And it's also about preserving historic memory which is of great importance because communication history runs for three generations and then only the senses and narratives continue to operate that have been handed over, passed down the generations. So in this case that we are talking about now, this is extremely necessary and helpful not only for the people who are engaged in law but also to writers, artists, journalists. They may have different kinds of access, and this can also be helpful to all to all different levels. And because this is our last panel of today, and I'm much disturbed that our audience may be left pessimistic concerning our future. Neither I nor any other panelist, panel, uh, this fellow panelist, knows much about the future. Some of us are more, others are less pessimistic or optimistic. But the truth lies in the fact that in the past, people fighting for justice and freedom very frequently failed. Therefore, our uh, struggle, our fight is of greater importance. My friends from Syria keep saying to me, what do you need? We will do it all because your success equals our success. So let me finish by saying that the future is no guaranteed or determined, but we still have a chance and we have to fight for this future. Thank you very much, Alexandra. This is highly optimistic to hear it, it from you. Listening to you, I caught myself thinking how many times Ukrainians were holding on to the fact, keep fighting and you will prevail. How many lost lives are part of this paved way to the independence of Ukrainians and their struggle for their own destiny and I suppose that we are a generation that will be able to witness a triumphant end of this fight and this sounds highly optimistic. Thank you very much Alexandra. Now Natalia, the floor is yours. Well, I do believe and I sense that while our fight is ongoing, it's a duty of every one of us to our children to document and record everything unfolding and work for the sake of the victory and recovery of justice. I agree with Alexandra. No one knows the future, but no one but us will work for the sake of the, our victory and justice. We can only be helped, but no one will be doing this work for us. That's a very nice phrase. I want our children to study and learn from our mistakes, but not from their own mistakes. And when I say about our mistakes, I do not mean the mistakes of us as Ukrainians. I mean the mistakes committed by our generation worldwide, because we live in the world where there is no security, global security system in place, where various war crimes can be committed and there is no sensation that punishment is inevitable and tyrants can do whatever they wish. Documentation, creating this paradigm and request for justice in the global sense of this word must become our mission eventually and I will be working on that from evening, from morning till dusk and I hope that one day an institution will arise that will assume leadership in this respect and we will be able to help this institution. I never thought, never in my whole life have I thought that the stories of my granny when she was telling me stories about the war that she had lived through, when she went to my grandfather from 
uh, her uh, village 110 kilometers on foot to get some food to uh, my grand father when he, she was hiding her children in the basement of her house. I could never have imagined that the same could happen to me, to all of us. And I don't want my children to tell their children what I will be telling them and my husband, Will, and my mom. So our task is till our last breath to do all to prevent this from repeating never again. Thank you, Natalia. Sola, please. I always address international audiences when they ask me, how are you? I say, our life goes on until, as long as it goes on. So as a follow-up to our granny stories, poor grannies, they have been through all the same stories, horrific ones, in the context of our history. I've always been saying that the decision to flee Kiev, which I'm so much in love with, was prompted by two ladies to me, my granny, who was the first historic teacher to me, and Anna Politkovska, may her soul rest in peace. Politkovska, due to Putin, is no longer alive because she was recounting stories and truth of the Chechen wars. I had no doubt I would die that I, if I stayed in Kiev because I cannot speak Russian freely. I wouldn't be able to hide if I had had to. I didn't have this tactical advantage. Therefore, I escaped from my wonderful, beloved Kiev. But one joke I wanted to um, say, to tell. Uh, when we set up the German Institute in March this year, my father and I were going in a, a car and on the border with Ukraine. We were so tired when crossing the border with Ukraine. After we had crossed it, we wrote that uh, my granny was already hospitalized. She's a senior lady of 90 years old. And without going home, we immediately went to hospital and began to ask her how she was. And immediately in the 15th story, 15 minute of our conversation, she began to once again reminisce about how she went from Berlin to, to Skoblenitz in Germany all the way home. And she said, I could only see the ruins of Berlin because it was a vehicle with high borders. And all of us, we started crying while the granny said, why are you crying? Everything's okay, I'm alive. So for her it's okay because she is not suffering so much when thinking back to the past. So I understood after a while I will become a granny who will be telling her stories to her children and grandchildren and she will be okay when telling these stories. But one constructive thing, these 1,000 lessons that my granny taught to me first as a first historian in my life taught me um, one thing that we began to talk seriously starting in 2006. It's the Great Famine, Holodomor. Thankfully, we managed to explore quite a lot, open the archives and learn more facts about it because without it, perhaps, the joy of life that we are experiencing and our resilience would be different these days. So let's keep talking. And while we are still alive, while our hearts are still beating, because we are still responsible to the dead, alive, and those who are to be born. Thank you, Solomia, for uh, remembering about the joy of life that we Ukrainians are so happy to experience. Now, Dr. Tsevinsky, please. When we're speaking about oral history, the stories of the people, their personal accounts, We say that these stories will have to be used and by journalists and lawyers. But most importantly, you will be using these stories as well as your children. And that's the most important. because now it's very visible and it feels so well. When you speak to people, you immediately see the expression of Ukrainian identity, how it consolidates people. 
сезону ту же самую украинскую. And the so-called constitution for this consolidated Ukrainian uh, solidarity, the foundation for it will be this oral history. I very much wish all of you that due to this history, you will be able to create something solid, robust, truly Ukrainian. I'm incredibly thankful to you for inviting me to this forum. Thanks a lot. Piotr, thank you very much for your concluding words. Our time is exhausted, and I would like to thank all of our speakers. Friends, at the junction of your expertise, your huge experience, it seems to me that we have spoken so much about such important things despite the difficulty of the topics that we had to raise within this brief period of time. But also like to thank our audience, that our audiences are still staying with us. I would also like to thank our interpreters. Yes, definitely. Indubitably, I very much thank our audience. And it's great comfort and joy for me that this final conversation is focused on the future. And more than other things, it speaks about how important these document experiences of the war are. So, Alex, the floor goes to you. Thank you, Nasta, for this truly deep conversation. It's really beautiful. But we are still not bidding goodbye to you because there's one more final point to our conversation, another key speech. Let me introduce an, a representative of the international partner of the USC Shaw Foundation, who is to be our next participant of the forum, Inna Wohina, an archiving specialist at the Shaw Foundation Visual History Archive. She has been working of, at the Institute since 1999 as an analyst of historical contact, as a coordinator of international programs, and an international associate specialist in digital education. The topic of the final speech is the USC Shaw Foundation work in Ukraine preserving the past for the sake of the better future. Hello. Tell me, please, if you see my presentation. Yeah, yeah, we can see that. We can see the materials, and we are listening to you. Okay, I will be speaking English to make sure that my colleague understand. First, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude for the privilege of addressing this forum. It is my honor to present the work done by USC Shoah Foundation, the Institute for Visual History and Education at University of Southern California, to document and preserve eyewitness stories, to capture the truth of a historic event that touched upon millions of lives and tragically resulted in the millions of lives lost, the Holocaust. Tonight is a particular honor for me because Holocaust is part of my home country's history, the history of Ukraine. The part of history that I grew to fully understand only through my work at USC Shaw Foundation, which interviewed thousands of Holocaust survivors and witnesses in Ukraine and all over the world, and which from its inception embarked on a journey aimed at preserving testimonies and perpetuity bringing testimonies home and making them available for education, scholarship, and research worldwide. Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, the USC Shoah Foundation's predecessor, was established by Steven Spielberg in 1994. In order to collect and preserve video testimonies from survivors and witnesses to the Holocaust, Within several years, the foundation gathered nearly 52,000 audiovisual interviews, now known as our legacy collection. The interviews were originally recorded in 56 countries in 32 languages. 
in Ukraine from 1995 through 1999. The foundation recorded over 3,400 testimonies in all of Ukraine's administrative divisions, including 24 oblasts in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. Among them, 427 testimonies were recorded in Kyiv and Kyivska oblast, 635 testimonies in Odessa and Odessa oblast, and 786 testimonies in Vinnytsia and Vinnytsia oblast. Today, the Visual History Archives holdings include over 11,000 testimonies with the interviewees born within Ukraine's current borders. About 15,000 interviews discuss events and experiences that transpired there, more than one in four interviews in the entire archive. This body of knowledge is a result of ongoing USC Shaw Foundation's own documentation efforts and global partnerships. Today, the Institute preserves and provides access to over 56,000 oral history interviews recorded in 65 countries in 45 languages, amassing 115,000 hours of testimony footage. It would take one person over 13 years to watch all of the interviews held in the Visual History Archive. The archive's rich content related to Ukraine became a driving force of many important educational and scholarly projects. In 2006 and 2007, we produced a documentary film, Spell Your Name, and a robust educational program, Encountering Memory, with support from the Victor Pinchuk Foundation and local NGO partners. Spell Your Name is a feature-length documentary about the Holocaust in Ukraine. The film director, Serhii Bukovsky, crafted the film using testimonies from the Visual History Archive, a new footage shot on location in Ukraine. The film premiered in 2006 and distributed in Ukrainian theaters the following year in Kyiv, Dnipro, Chernivtsi, Odessa, and Kharkiv. In 2007-2008, in partnership with Nevada Ba, the Ukrainian History Teachers Association. We trained 3,200 educators in each region of the country on the use of spell your name and encountering memory in the classroom. In response to requests made by teacher participants during the encountering memory training, in 2009, we worked with the authors in Ukraine to develop another multimedia educational resource based on the archives testimonies Ukrainian famine of 1932-1933, Human Dimension of the Tragedy, authored by Alexander Voitenko and Mihailo Tagli. The world's leading historians, Timothy Snyder, Samuel Totten, and Stanislav Kulchitsky, reviewed the teacher's guide bef before it was published, providing historical expertise. 680 teachers from 19 regions of Ukraine received training on the use of the Holodomor eyewitness accounts in the classroom. Through the USC Shoah Foundation's work in Ukraine, teachers and students received an opportunity to learn about the human dimension of the local history and the totalitarian policies that resulted in the humanitarian catastrophe. The Institute's work in Ukraine in 2011 involved supporting the educational impact of Patrick Dubois Shoah by Bullets exhibit brought to Ukraine from the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris by the Victor Pinchuk Foundation in September of 2011. The United States Embassy in Ukraine funded the development of an educational resource and teacher training program to accompany the exhibit. We utilized testimony from Visual History Archive to develop Pain of Memory, a multimedia resource to support the exhibit for educators and their students in Ukraine. We partnered with the Ukrainian Center for Holocaust Studies to develop a training program for exhibit guides to ensure the best possible educational experience during the exhibit. The eyewitness testimonies preserved in the Visual History Archive have proven to be an effective tool not only in teaching history, but also in human rights studies. In 2013, we produced a comprehensive multimedia teacher's guide titled, Where do human rights begin? Lessons of history and contemporary approaches. The project was initiated in cooperation with VAD, the Association of Jewish Organizations and Communities of Ukraine, 
and the German Foundation Remembrance, Responsibility and Future. It was approved by Ukraine's Ministry of Education and Science. The guide features the rights guaranteed by the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, along with the historical reviews of human rights violations in Nazi Germany and Stalin's USSR, and contemporary cases from the European Court of Human Rights. This guide and the accompanying training program proved to be an important support mechanism for more than 1,000 educators across Ukraine as the recent violence and civil unrest unfolded. We could have not anticipated the intersection of the provision of this material and the surrounding events, said Kim Simon, the USC Shaw Foundation's managing director in 2014, as the armed conflict unfolded in the Donbass region. It only highlighted the importance and critical need for human rights education in Ukraine and beyond. We have much more work to do, but continue to be committed to our contribution in these challenges times. The Institute continued to conduct the human rights research training for the next several years in Ukraine. In the meantime, from 2016 through present, the Institute has made available full-length testimonies and multimedia testimony-based educational resources through its educational platform, Eyewitness. 28 Ukrainian language lesson plans are available today for teachers and students all based on testimonies from the Visual History Archive. Used every day by scholars in the creation of books, articles, monographs, and dissertations, the Visual History Archive is unique in its ability to advance genocide research. Scholars in many fields have utilized the resources of the Visual History Archive to teach more than 400 university courses across four continents, including 112 courses at University of Southern California. Hundreds of scholarly works using the archive's testimonies have been published. The most recent published in Ukraine is a monograph by the Center of Jewish History and Culture of Kuras Institute of Political and Ethnic Studies of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, titled Sociopolitical and Historical Aspects of Developing the Modern Jewish Community in Ukraine, the European Context. It attempts to identify and analyze the main sociopolitical and historical aspects in the development of modern Jewish community in Ukraine, as well as to highlight the main prospects for its development in the near future in the context of Euro Ukraine's European integration. The monograph reveals the development of Hasidism in the present stage, the historical fate of Krimchaks, the specifics of Babi Yar, memorialization and the relations between Jewish communities in the countries of European Union and national governments. One of the contributing authors uh, who wrote um, about Krimchaks in chapter four that you see on screen, Mikhailo Tagli, research associate at the Ukrainian Center for Holocaust Studies and managing editor of the Holocaust and Modernity Scholarly Journal spent two years as the interviewer for the Shaw Foundation in the 1990s, conducting around 100 testimonies of Jewish Holocaust survivors, Krimchaks, and rescuers in the Crimea. The main goal of my work in this field is through acquainting those who are interested in historical facts and tragic events in the European history to demonstrate the dangers of xenophobia and intolerance and alert them to the historical conditions under which society may become prone to mass violence, ethnic cleansing, and genocide, Chagli said. Today, USC Shaw Foundation continues to document Holocaust survivor testimonies, both in traditional and innovative formats, including 3D interactive video biography technology called Dimensions and Testimony and the 360 degree immersive technology on location. In today's reality, when peaceful coexistence of sovereign states has been disrupted by the conflict escalation around the world, we have been reminded again and again of the importance of heritage preservation and keeping history alive. It is through the eyewitness stories that we see the true nature of the catastrophic events that occurred in the past and continue to occur as we speak today. It is through these stories that people of today and future generations will have the opportunity to recognize the impact these events have had on the individuals, families, communities, and culture 
and strive to build a better future and better world without genocide and crimes against humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Ina Gogina. And uh, it's uh, maybe a sad moment, as it always happens when uh, we're working effortlessly. And a great experience is uh, meeting your fellow scholars. And now it's time to say goodbye. And with a great pleasure, I would like to say that many important things were said today. And you're doing very valuable work documenting and processing war experiences for the future, for politicians, for to achieve victory, to achieve justice, to form future knowledge about this period, and to democratize history because history doesn't just have leaders. It has people like us, and this experience should be incorporated there as well. Uh, we have another forum ahead in a year, and I wish you better news from the front line, and hopefully we will be able to work outside of this trauma uh, so that it uh, complies with the methodology of oral history. Thanks to Armed Forces of Ukraine for giving us the possibility to meet and talk about these important experiences. And on your behalf, I would like to say thanks to organizers, the initiative of the uh, Civilian Voices Museum, Renat Akhmetov Fund, and Association of Oral History and Shoah Foundation. Educational partners, Kiev National University, and Marie Curie Sklodowska University. And finally, I would like to say that you don't have to say goodbye now. You can continue your conversations and you can go upstairs on the third floor where you had lunch and you can exchange your experience, exchange your potential projects that can be implemented in cooperation. That's the best this forum can do. Thanks a lot. And as some people suggested that we can have a final group photo. So those who participated in the panel discussions, please stay here. Thanks a lot. My name is Alexey Ananov, and I hope that we'll meet together again. During this war, everyone has its own story. We've seen something you will never forget, something we don't have the right to forget. I would like to express my gratitude to